England don't really stay in the tournaments for that long. So why would these companies put everything into designing a sick like a sick uh, kit for a team Money. that's only going to be in it for two weeks? Because <laughs> we're mugs and we still buy it, whether, whether we're in the tournament or not. As long as long as long as they're in the tournament on the first day, everyone buys it. Oh, exactly. of course, yeah, all well, the fans. I saw, I saw a twin doing that. Twin the other day tweeted that um, on the first match, just before the first match, he's like, do I buy a kit or not? <clears throat> it all depends on how the first game went. So I'm assuming, yeah, as long as you um as long as you have a kit out there, people will buy it. But it would be nice if you had a nice kit. Yeah, I, d- I did buy the blue one this year. I'm not gonna lie. I, w- I wasn't interested in the kits, to be fair, but the blue one has got a little a little bit of something bit of about sauce. it. A little, little bit of sauce on there. But yeah, I'm a German today. <laughs> I know, I know. I Especially know. after last night, that's a bit dubious, isn't it? I know. I bought the kit yesterday for the cheek of it. Right, oh. I'm out. I'm out of my depth now. I'm not going to lie. I nice. um, believe that. So let's let's start with my apology to Stylus because like Hanif and I were just chatting for for. I bet I was getting cost, about, right? Was I getting well, cost? No, nah, not really. Not really. He was just saying no. I, sorry, I'm going. I'm no. going to throw. Yeah. I'm going to throw you under the bus. Throw, on, throw him under the bus. <laughs> I was saying he was meant to be here at twelve. He's half an hour late. So yeah. I'll throw you under the bus there. Sorry. Yeah. I was, I've been sat here texting him, bruv. I'm here. I don't believe that either, though, Stylus. But yeah, cool. Yo, you can move. Right, you know, no, he, I, actually, he actually did send me a WhatsApp. You know, you know, we're, phone. Lucky, we're lucky, we're lucky um, we got proof in it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I sent the... Uh, anyway, I sent sorry, the, guys. My, Zoom my details, bad. I sent them to Hanif and then just completely left Stylus out of the loop. So he's sat in his studio waiting. If you guys want to chop it up without me, like that. <laughs> <laughs> never that, never that. Feel free. Anyway. anyway, talk over podcast, double stylus, and today's very special guest, Hanif. Oh, I, should I introduce you as Hanif Boogie? No, Hanif is cool right. as long as people know your first name. That's important, though. No? There you go. Hanif works. And you got an introduction. We actually don't really even do introductions here. I appreciate but that. I felt you I felt still, you're still Hanif Boogie to me. Oh, mate. <laughs> There's been different names throughout the years, so yeah, I'm happy with that one. So it, it was that like your initial DJ name, or uh, like it? what's the story around this Hanif Boogie uh, flex? Um, do you know what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> caught, caught him off with the first question. <laughs> uh, do you know what? Um, no, I had a really corny DJ name, a really cool DJ name. Um, I used to go, so I was at uni. College or uni, right? So I started DJing and doing parties. And I thought it'd be really cool to call myself. My first name being, so I'd use my initial. And then I thought, oh yeah, you know, like the bomb sign. I called myself H-bomb. And I did that and it ran for years. H-bomb. That's all right though. (laughs) No, it it really isn't. It really isn't. Um, Looking back at it. But yeah, managed to carve myself a little bit of a career doing that whilst at uni and just after uni and then um a lot later i started working with trevor nelson right and trevor just said no, just nah. <laughs> drop that name just call yourself <laughs> hanif in it that's your name just go with that and so that and boogie just like matt white used to call me boogie all the time okay and so it just stuck me and matt used to work together and uh, he used to call me boogie and it just stuck. So when it came to like social media, I went with Boogie. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Horrible story. Horrible story. The star is born. It's it's mad, isn't it? When you always ask people how they get the names and it's most times it's just the most basic, like you always think there's going to be like an intricate, deep story behind people's names. Uh, Like, yeah, it's just one of the things I kind of ran with at the time. It's still better than Martin Too Smooth. (laughs) 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 Um, No, it's funny because I think most DJs, where they start so young, they kind of just pick up whatever or whatever nicknames around at the time. Yeah. I think very few people actually realize, hang on, like this could turn into like a business or a brand. So let me be forward thinking and actually come up with something that's brand worthy. 100%. But I think like I'm, I'm like the generation before you guys. Yeah. So we were even less like likely to become DJs. Like it was just... Right. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't something that you thought was going to, you'd love to, but you didn't think it was going to happen and you weren't thinking that far ahead. Now, if you're coming into the game, you're thinking about your Instagram handle, All this, that it. and the other. You know what I mean? It's, it's, your branding, you guys' branding is so on point. Me, I thought on, on Microsoft Word, the bomb logo 
as the O in bomb was was genius. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was, was on, part of my reason for pain. bloody choosing the name, right? But no, nah, you guys, it, it, it's it's so important now. Um, yeah, we were we were just winging it, absolutely winging it. Yeah, it's crazy. Like I see DJs now, like coming in, they've got a name and a logo before they've even done a mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah trust me, they've trust got me. press shots before they've even out the gates. Like it's crazy. It's a business, man. It's a business. Yeah. I think I think the, the tools are different now as well. So like you can build a brand from scratch, like go even back to Hanif saying he was the generation before us. None of the tools were, like that we have now were even available to be able to build a brand as quick as you can now. Like you say, kids have got logos, branding, everything locked in before they're actually even putting mm -hmm. mixes out or actively yeah. playing out in the clubs. So yeah, diff different times, man. Do you feel like in the uni days when you started out, so to be a DJ or be a successful DJ on that circuit, do you feel like it was a popularity contest then? Or was it kind of just um, turn up at the right place and play? It might have been. I, I think if you were popular, you're always going to do better. But I, I mm. definitely wasn't popular. Um, I was a quiet guy. <laughs> I was really quiet. I was really, really quiet. But I was a music person. Like, but like most of us are music people, right? You got into it because you love music. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I wasn't fortunate enough to grow up around really cool music. You know, like there'd be people saying, yeah, on a Sunday, my parents are playing Al Green and Stevie. Nah, I wasn't. <laughs> I grew up in an Asian household in London, in Tower Hamlets, where music wasn't a thing. And I remember when I, but I was into music. So even when I was like really young, I remember my, the first record I bought was when I was five. It's only because my parents had this record player, which they didn't use. And I said I needed to, I wanted to play something. So my mum took me to a shop and I bought a police album, right? Because probably mm -hmm. was popular at that point. But then as I got older, I remember like me getting all my music from Top of the Pops. I was I was a mad commercial kid because I didn't have any other influence. But when but looking back at it, all the music that I did like seemed to be more black music inspired. It was inspired by soul, but I just didn't realize it. Anything mm -hmm. that had a bit of soul, that's what I was probably I was really into. Um, but it's only when I got to school, secondary school, um, and there was one, uh, there's, a, there's a friend of mine called Darren, he was a year above me, and he used to buy records on his way home. We used to go to the bus stop and it used to be at our price near, near us. And his oh, family, gosh, you know. yeah, 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 his <laughs> family, his, fa like his, his background is he was from the Caribbean, right? His, his family were from or West Indian. So it's then that I realized, oh shit, I like the music that he, I was then starting to be opened up to all of that. So yeah, I got into it by buying music because I just really, really loved it. Got to college, I had a decent record collection. So when they were gonna throw a party, like we used to do a summer party at our college or any party, there used to be a Christmas party. Um, I was one of the kids that, that had music. I'd, oh. I'd started collecting music from about 13, 14 years old. Um, so yeah, I got into it because I really wanted to play the music and I wanted to play them. I wanted to play you the music that I loved because when we was coming up, you weren't hearing the music that I loved anywhere. Mm. And so when I went to college, it was cool. A lot of the black kids, a lot of the Asian kids who were into R&B. This is when MTV was starting to play black music, a lot American black music. Like, and then you had the record, like you, cause I was, a, I was buying records. Um, yeah, I was asked to DJ. I couldn't DJ, but I knew I wanted to do it. So I wasn't popular in that way. Um, but yeah, if you were popular, it's a head start, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's mad, isn't it? To think that in that time, people didn't just have music. Like yeah. a lot of people didn't collect music. So it was either like if they got a CD for their birthday or what was on the radio. Well, just, just, just as we used to like take music from the radio. So when yeah, I got yeah. into black music, like I mean, before, when I was young and I was into Top of the Pops, on a Sunday, the chart show on Radio 1, I'd be recording, right, on a tape. Yep. But as I got older and I found some of the pirate stations or some of the stations that had black music on there, but like at midnight on a Saturday mm -hmm. night, I started recording that music. But I didn't, and then I realised how I would collect the music. And then when I'm at college, I'd do tapes for people, right? Yeah. Because yeah, people didn't have access to, to music, but I, I had the stuff. So, you know, I was taking it from the vinyl and put it onto little compilation tapes. Yeah, people didn't have access to music like that. You couldn't just go on demand and say, oh, I want to hear this. You had to yeah. buy it. 
that's crazy isn't it? and even when it comes to the party as well like you're saying like you got chosen not because you had a huge oh. fan, like have huge fan base. He was the only guy. I had the music. No, no, no. He was the only one that had the tunes. <laughs> I had the tunes. Like, do you know what I mean? I that had the music. Like a slight bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but, but it, that was it. Do you know what I mean? And like, so 100%, you had the music. Yeah, you might you might be able to spin. That's crazy. That's amazing. It's, it's mad to see how far like the actual technology has come from that only beat. Like that wasn't even too long ago, really, when you think about it. To see no, that we but are now... now. You, but now you guys will probably not necessarily you guys, but I do from time to time hear people saying anyone can be a DJ because they've got access to Real talk. music that you can get. They can get pretty much a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, it's changed things. We have this conversation a lot, don't we? Double about the entry level now, like it's so low because anybody like can just you can just do it now. Like anybody can just be a DJ and grab a controller, sign up to DJ City, and pretty much yeah, I think you can, you can have a good go at it. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. Well, the way I feel about it, which regular listeners will know how I feel about it, but I think the best way to summarize it is anyone can DJ, but not anyone can be a DJ, if that makes sense. Like to be a DJ, you've really got to be in it. You've got to know the culture of whatever music you're playing. You've got to know the history. You've got to just be able to like the knowledge, the technical skills, the passion, everything. However, you can just DJ by picking up a controller downloading the latest hundred songs from Drake or whatever, and then off you go. Yeah, but exactly. that should separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Should do anyway. It doesn't oh, work quite really like that, but yeah. yeah, hopefully the people that are really about it, they're the ones that come through and the people are just doing it for the sake of doing it. Maybe, you know, it won't be their long-term career. Hmm. I hear that. I hear that. Where did the DJing go for you then? So from the college parties, how did that um, evolve into you meeting Trevor Nelson? Um, there was loads before that, to be honest. So uh, then I went to uni and at uni, there used to be some like, so uni was really good then. So you, th- you couldn't go to mainstream clubs like you can now and hear black music. Mm-hmm. But interestingly enough, because there was a lot of Asian and black kids or, really, or just in you know, London kids or kids from London who love black music, the uni used to put, most unis used to have a soul night. They used to call it a soul night back then, yeah. But it basically R and B and hip hop. This is the early days. I, I would say so for me, being at uni was around 92, 93. So just as like hip hop R and B was coming in, New Jack Swing was kind of kind of there or lit finishing, but you know, hip hop R and B um was coming in, R and B hip hop was coming in, um, the Mary J. Blige, the Puff Daddy era, and all of that. So most unis in their bar would run a night and they would be the busiest nights. They would run an RB night. Um, so yeah, so again, when I got to uni, I'm like, the first year I was watching the guys and I was a little bit like, oh, these guys ain't that great. I'm better. <laughs> so, but I couldn't get in, right? They had, they had the monopoly, right? They had monopoly. So I was like, no, 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 these guys. So um, my flatmates who happened to be a year older than me and they knew a few people at the uni they were like all right cool we'll help you um but i still got blocked by the uh, by the already established djs actually one of them is now like you know he became a friend but you know he wanted to hold on to that gig of course he did yeah um so in the end um my flatmate said look let's just throw a party let's do a party you can dj we we found a wine bar a little wine bar that held 150 people and because there was such an appetite for it my housemates, who were good networkers, and I wasn't, I was just the quiet geeky guy. Um, we sold out. And I remember like the first part, I, I did it with another friend of mine who was on my course. He was also a DJ. Um, his, his brother was a, a wedding DJ, right? They had all the equipment. So he said, yeah, we'll go and hire this place. I'll put the sound in and we go 50-50, right? Mate, I walked out with like 400 quid. No, I was like, oh, what? we sold out. Yeah, yeah, we sold out. We made, it was just like, oh, this is easy. So, yeah, so that's that. So, that, that it started like that. And then what happened is in my second year and third year, I started meeting other people. There's a good friend of mine um, who I used to, I used to work in a, um, a trainer shop. I'm showing my age. I used to work in a shop called Olympus, yeah, um, which is before, before JD Sports or any of these guys. Yeah? Wow. Keep and, sports days in that. Jesus. Yeah, man. So wow. <laughs> one, one of the guys who used to work with me, um, he's he was part of a kind of sound 
and his mate used to run a student night in the West End. And he said, look, I'll bring you in. You've got a bit of a following at your uni, I'll bring you in. We, me and my friends at uni had, had done a couple of parties, done really, really well. So promoters started going, ah, oh, this guy might be able to bring people to my roof, as it always works, right? Because, um, you know, I, I probably had asked the guy previously, he wasn't interested. And this is what I always say to DJs, we say, oh, what should I do to get, I'm like, they'll come to you if they think you're important. Mm. Like, if they feel like you can add something to them, they'll do it. So it wasn't because I was the best DJ. These guys realized that at my uni, I was doing these parties and I had a captive audience. So maybe if we book this donut, he'll, he'll bring a few people, <laughs> right? So I ended up um, getting into this club called Limelight in the West End, which is now closed. It was on Shaftesbury Avenue. Tuesday night used to be rammed. And again, I feel like um, me as a DJ, I was a little bit more concerned about playing well and breaking music back then which was probably looking back at it some people probably thought what is he playing because I was always trying to push the boundaries whereas other DJs would just come and play the bangers and they was happy but I started off yeah so I started off there doing um the warm-up sets went really really well made really good friends and networks with a lot of people um like other promoters and whatever and then what happened is some of the guys I started working with, and this is predominantly in the Asian student scene, right? Um, we started to branch out and started to do bigger and bigger events. Um, and so we start, one of my friends, him and his crew, they worked out how to book American artists. This is really mm -hmm. early, right? They booked, they, and because again, black music wasn't big. No, apart from Choice FM, nobody was playing black music, right, mm. on radio. Apart from Choice FM, no one was doing shows with any of these big American artists. Um, and then one of my friends, him and his crew, they made contact with Intro, the R&B group, right? Mad. And they brought them over. Mad. And, and it did really, really well. How did they make contact back then? Because nowadays it's you know almost easy. Out. You just find the manager and then DM them. This yeah, is like no, the, this I, is like I, the I early blueprint out. stuff. This. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, do you know what? I need to ask. My, it's my mate, Neil, who is still my business partner in, in the concerts that we do. Um, I don't know. I think they... Do you know what? I genuinely... Because these were... I'm going to be really stereotyping here, right? <laughs> they were really rich Indian kids, right? <laughs> really rich Indian kids. I think the first time they flew over to America and made links, Got the links. right? And they came back. Uh, okay. And also, I think there's a there's a yeah, friend, no. another friend of ours called Abraham, who now manages One Twelve. Weirdly enough, but he's from the UK. He was a mover and shake. Like he was a networker. So he every he would hook up with the Americans, whatever. So he made the connect. So anyway, fast forward a little bit. We started. I started working with them as a promoter. Uh, and a DJ um, and I think the first big thing we did together we did Drew Hill when they were super hot oh, super sick. super hot and we had like 5,000 people turn up and it was on Christmas Eve it's weird right we oh. did a party on Christmas Eve at Bagley's 5,000 people turned up um, and I used to book the DJs that I liked that were not from our scene um, because it was a good way of me networking so I booked Matt White that's how Matt, like, you know, Matt started seeing the parties that I used to do on the student scene and he went, rah. So he offered me a job um, to help him, like, promote records to the student work, student DJs and student campuses. He was at Polydor at the time. Mm -hmm. So I worked with him there. I booked him, like, we, we did Usher. We did a show with Usher on his first album when My Way went to number one, right? We booked him in November when he, we didn't know. My partner, Neil, just got a call or however they contacted each other back then, saying, look, you've got this artist called Usher. A Sell pigeon flew into the hey, office. who knows? Message. I need to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got, I mean, maybe he had a, you know, one of the big cell phones. But he just said, look, it, you know, Usher is available, this new artist, Usher. The record had just started coming out. I knew what it was. I didn't know it was going to, my way was going to be a number one record. But um, he said, look, we should do it what do you think and I said yeah, yeah yeah let's do it so we signed it in November for to do to bring him over at Valentine's corny we used to do corny dates Valentine's was a big date in the, in the diary 
And then by January, he had the biggest number one. He, do you know what I mean? And so we did the first show with Usher. And again, I booked certain DJs and they, they started to see that we was doing mad numbers on a Tuesday night, mad <laughs> numbers on a Thursday night. That's how I met Trevor. So mm. I started working in a record shop off the back of that. Um, a friend of mine used to run this record shop called Uptown Records. He owned it. He knew me from when I was young. He said, do you want to come and work for me? I said, yeah, cool. Being at the record shop, I started meeting Trevor, blah, 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 all these people. So one day I just said to Trevor, I want to book you for an event. And this is when Trevor was just starting on Radio 1. When it, when it, was, it, was, when it was affordable. <laughs> it's still expensive, mate. It's I know. Still expensive. <laughs> Trust me. And for a Tuesday night, but I thought, yeah, let's do it. He came and did this gig. And he, he tells he, he was the one who told me this. He goes, mate, I came to your gig. You had 1,500 people on a Tuesday night going mad for R&B, predominantly Asian. He said, I want to work with you. <laughs> and in the end, he offered me a job. I used to work for Trevor for a bit, um, for a good couple of years, um, helping him with his music and stuff like that. But yeah, so it was the promotion that I used to do that kind of introduced me to a lot of the DJs, the bigger DJs, who then kind of took me under their wing. I then worked with, I worked on... Um, me and Nick Smooth, a friend of mine, Nick Smooth, used to work on um, Matt's show on Kiss. So we used to be like his co-host on there. Um, and then that developed. So yeah, I just, everything happened really organically, but a lot of it was down to the fact that we used to do these parties and everyone was like, how the hell are you putting 2,000 kids into a party on a Tuesday night? I want to know about this. I want to be a part of it. What, 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 what's, 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 the secret, what's the secret then? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so go on. Let us know. You're asking the wrong guy, mate. Like, You're asking the wrong guy. Like, um, we, we've obviously done a lot of events up here. Like, we've never really touched on, like, the concert side of it and the kind of level that you guys are. So we kind of know what goes into it. But, like, what's what's the difference when you weigh up, like, the different styles of events that you can promote from, saying, like, running Milkshake to doing, like, local events to doing the big-ass concert, like, cool. arena things? It's just progression, isn't it? It's just development. Like, what was it like when you started DJ? What you were doing then to now? It's just progression. And I always had, um, I'm going to be real. I love music, yeah? I love music. But I love business. I've always loved business. My family, like, my dad was a businessman. I, I, I just wanted to be business. So maybe in this day and age, if I was in this day and age, I could have taken myself more seriously as a DJ. But... Come on, you lot have been there, right? You know what it's like to pay a DJ and you know what it's... Sorry, you know what it's like to earn money at the door and you mm. know what it's like to get paid by the promoter. Mm -hmm. so I just looked at that and I went... You know what I mean? As, as much as I did really, really well from DJ, bro, it's financentially, it's, not, it's nowhere near the same. It's not even in the same bag, is it? Not no, it's not. The Unless you're one of the big boys. Yeah, the only difference I would point out is even though it's lower, I think as a DJ if you're working with the right people, it's guaranteed. Even if there's no people through <laughs> the door, you're still, if you're working with the if right people, if you're working with the right you're people, you're still getting, yeah, okay. That's a key part of my sentence there. But you're, you're still life, getting Your paid. life's a lot easier as well, right? If you don't, like, taking away all the work on the promo side of it, obviously yeah. it's easy to just sit up and get the check, but... I agree. I agree. It I, depends. I, I, you have to have that mentality, right? You want to be that person who maybe wants to take a risk. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just a different mentality. And I just, I, I've always enjoyed like the visual side of packaging up an event, making it look great. It's, a, it's, it, it's all about marketing at the end of the day. And I, and I love marketing. Um, I just didn't realize as much as I love playing, I, I, I still love DJing if it's what I want to play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, for me, it was, it was always, when I saw this opportunity, I, I wasn't going to let go. Whereas I think with a lot of, DJs, it might be the other way. You'd be like, no, 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 I really want to concentrate on my DJ, mm -hmm. which is fair. Do you know what I mean? Which is cool. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just like the business side. I, lo I love, I love being able to like. I, I used to love design, coming up with a, a design for a flyer. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I suppose I ended up doing what I really wanted to do. I feel, I feel like uh, more and more DJs are, are learning more about the business side of it and are stepping into. <laughs> doing more events like we spoke about this before like when we used to do jam we were like one of the first local djs to actually separate from promoters and kind of take it on ourselves and not as many people were really doing it 
back then, but I feel like now more and more and more people are kind of taking, like you say, if you can't get an in, if you can't get an into a spot and you can generate your own it's, vibe. It's like, my advice. It's, it's always been my advice. Go and do your own event. Always been my own advice. Go and do your own event. And, and I found it difficult because I wasn't, um, I and I don't know if you will relate to this, but I wasn't, the super sociable person. I didn't have a massive network of friends. The best mm -hmm. promoters are the ones who've got wicked <laughs> network. Like, I, I keep going back to Martin. Martin, everyone loves Martin. Everyone knows yeah. Martin. If Martin throws a party, a thousand people might turn up. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that guy, but I'll still develop it and I'll do it. So yeah, um, I, do, I do think it is the way forward for all DJs. And, and obviously the last 12 months, has made you DJs a lot more self-sufficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not having to rely on, like, you know, people like Continental GT, people like Silk in Birmingham, like they're oh, proving mate, that. Silk. Yeah. It. yeah, so they're proving that. I'm not saying that you don't need a promoter, because you do. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> don't put yourself but, out of the job, bro. Uh, no, you know what it is? <clears throat> I think it's always, in, I think for DJs, if you're going to put on your own events or at least transition into it, it's always worth partnering with a promoter. So a very good friend of mine, Hanif, you probably know him, Shocker from Southampton. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. We do RUM events together when they're out of South, out of Southampton. It's me and him doing them together. And part of that is because I wanted to do my own events, had absolutely no idea how to put, I knew the pieces of the puzzle. I just didn't know how to put them together to make a successful event. The other thing I have, and obviously we were chatting about this before we pressed record, I've moved about. So even though I started off in Brighton, I lived in Hertfordshire and now I'm in Kent. I don't have that solid base of people that I can say, right, there's a party tonight, come through and then 200 people are just standard going to come because my network of friends and people are spread across like the Southeast, the whole Southeast. So it's too difficult to get them all in the same place. So I found partnering with Shocker, who's an incredible businessman as well and a very, very good, very successful promoter. Yeah. Partnering with him, we were able to put on really good events. And so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you can find a partnership like that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to sell myself out of a, you know, myself <laughs> out of a job. No, but you know what? Sometimes, sometimes you guys don't want to concentrate on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As much as you might want to do your own event, it, it isn't always exactly your skill set that you really possess. And it might be that there might be someone who can really help you on the bits that you don't like. So yeah, good partnerships, but, yeah, I'm all for like people developing their themselves as a DJ by doing their own events. It is, and yeah, you might partner up with two, three people to do that, but it's still essentially you pushing yourself, and I think that's mm. that's a positive. Coming out of the pandemic, I think it's definitely like you said, teaming up with two or three people, especially if the other two see stylists like what you had with the the jam formula, the three mm. of you DJs, and you were all promoters as well for the mm. event. I think coming out of the pandemic, that's probably the best bet to keep the long-term work going, isn't it? Because with clubs shutting down and less work and more DJs being around, if you team up and do events, it kind of makes sense that way, I think. Have you? Lo have, do you feel like you're going to lose a lot of gigs already? Do you already know that there's venues that are gone? One of mine's definitely gone. Uh, Viper Rooms in Kingston. That was my, right. that was my Friday night. Wasn't that on the way out anyway, though, bro? Um, they had a limited lease or something. Yeah, they had like five years left on their lease, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was talk of the, the council wanting to develop it into flats or something like that. So there was some sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I tell a lie about the lease, actually, because no, we're not, the latest I heard was the lease ran out at the end of this June. Right. And they've just decided not to renew. So no, that five-year thing's wrong. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think it was... Because that's the thing, you know what, I, I, I'm... I'm happy to, for people to tell me, but most of the venues that I work with uh, across the country have, have managed to survive. I'm sure it's been tough, but I have managed to survive, um, which is a good thing. <clears throat> I, lo I lost, I lost two, two residences, student, mainly student nights, man. They were Deltic venues. Um, but which yeah, ones? Besides that, uh, one was in Preston, Evoke, um, and then there was one in Manchester that was just about to open. Um, well, yeah, they 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 didn't even end up getting the doors open, and they spent millions. So yeah, that. So that was Deltic, ideal. was it? Yeah, they, they might still open, bro, because this com the company Recom that bought Deltic are 
just piling money in and they're taking everything they're buying up loads of old and empty clubs and stuff it's crazy they've sent me over to fiction in handling now to replace the one in preston uh the one in manchester i've not heard anything about that the ven- i have no idea they I spent been peas out. yeah i don't want to be a, a, a geek but i think it's been bought out the one in manchester and he's got his finger on the pulse menu it was all the all, what? all the bits by recon or something no 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 it, it's else. um by some London and operate. It's going to be called. There's a venue in London called Cargo. I don't know if you guys have DJ'd there. Oh, oh no, not DJ. I know it though. Wow. Okay, but it's in Shoreditch, and the the same owners have bought Eden, and they're going to call it Cargo Manchester. Wow. There you go. Get your foot in the door there, style. The plot is ginormous, man. Like it used to be a Tiger Tiger back in the day. It's like three floors, seven rooms. Like it's absolutely. It's a great venue. I've man. heard it's. A, I heard the work that they did on it was amazing, but yep. they, no one got to see it. Yeah, they spent millions, man, but pff, bro, they didn't even get in the door. Wounded. I was like, oh. nice, fresh club to start when we go back right on my doorstep. I live about 50 yards from it. Yeah. What, what's what's the vibe from, from like some of the people that you worked with before, like the guys that employed you? Um, are people, obviously we've had this week the bad news of things being moved. Mm-hmm. Um, I still haven't <laughs> even checked the details. <laughs> I don't even know fully what it is. I just know it's June been 21st. A, I'm ride. not there to work. Is, yeah. So have, have you guys, have, have people, all the promoters and venues that you work with previously or ones you haven't worked with previously, are they starting to reach out? Is there stuff happening, bubbling away ideas? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know, most of the venues I was at, I've, I've <clears> managed <throat> to keep the relationship. I can't lie, in the middle of lockdown, you sit there and you think to yourself, like, am I going to come out of this with any work? Like, you just, obviously, people aren't really communicating in the middle of what was going on, so it's kind of yeah. like, it's kind of left in the lurch a little bit. You know, I mean, you don't know what's coming back, what gigs are going to be there, but then slowly but surely the calls start coming in and it's starting to feel positive, man. And obviously, sucker punch um, a couple of days ago, but bro, yeah. we've come this far now. What's a, you know I mean, it's another four weeks. Yeah, yeah. let's not have a conspiracy theory conversation. Yeah, let's though. not go there, man. Let's, <laughs> not, bro, let's not even do it. Let's not do yeah. it. Are you no. guys positive? Um, have you been positive? You know what? I, I'm up and down, to be honest. I think it's... There's some days where I'm like, oh, yeah, it's cool. It's all going to bounce back. Other days where I'll just wake up on the wrong side of bed and I'm like, I've, I've literally... The, the thing with me is I've very much tailored my entire career slash life around doing what I want to do. As selfish and bratty as that sounds, it's not actually this that guy. bad. But what I mean is like, I, I tried an office job when I was in my late teens, didn't like it. So I know that's not where I want to go. So I've avoided any kind of paperwork job. So I'm music, do you know what I mean? I've, I've directed everything. So every day for me working has been a pleasure. It's been amazing. Take that away. And it's kind of left like a void where I'm like, well, I like doing that stuff. Yeah, it's my job, but I really like doing it. So that's the days when I sort of sit and dwell on that. That's when I'm just get a bit negative. But How about you, Stannis? It's been such and go, man. Like I, I have some days where I feel super positive and I'm like, yes, we're gonna I'm creating all this new dope ideas. Like I've managed to like flatten out and kind of hit the restart button. You know, everything's kind of go, go, hundred mile an hour all the time. I enjoyed it at first, the first couple of months, but yeah, some days better than others, man. Some days I'm absolutely yeah. fine. Other days I just want to put the whole world to rights. <laughs> so it's well, but I, you... I'm, I'm an emotional guy, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I see that sometimes. I see that sometimes. <laughs> but, um, um, did you have anything that you've had to postpone because of this change? Because you obviously announced that you were going to do a jam. Yeah, we're, 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 that's still up in the air, man. Like, right. a lot of the venues are not willing to lock too much stuff in at the minute. Like, people are still walking on eggshells kind of thing. So. Yeah. We were just having them initial meetings. It's like Double said coming out of this. We were like, this was would be the perfect time for us to knock our heads together again and rejuvenate the brand and, and bring it back because mm. it still holds so much weight up here. <coughs> it just felt like yeah. the right time to do it. But again, we're, we're just kind of sat on it, waiting to see how things kind of ravel out. But besides that, we, we weren't really waiting on too much. I, I, did, I wasn't going to run around and lock in loads of events. I've seen people are trying to consistently keep it going and they have to move and resell tickets and move dates i'd kind of just avoided that and didn't bother jumping in with anything yet I'm yeah gonna, it's probably I'm not a, probably not a bad move to be honest um yeah I've, I've had, we're at the other end we're, we're like trying to move everything venues are fully booked and it's been such a pain but how's yeah. it been for you honey for like 15 months out like obviously it's for events especially Bro. it's you've 
completely out in the cold, right? Yeah. Um, we're very fortunate. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys have met my or know of my, I think you both do know of Louis, my business partner. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So Louis um, ha, has been a, such an amazing, it made such a difference to my business over the years. Um, so we've been in a fortunate place. At the last 10 years, have been really good, right? Really, really good. And we've saved for a rainy day, right? Yeah. Um, and so we've seen it through, uh, but, you know, we need to come out of it now. So we've been fortunate. Mm. And as much as I literally haven't earned a penny, right, in the last 15 months, like you say, but we've both been able to carry on. We've kept pretty much two of our staff the whole time. Um, we're now... Re- back to recruiting team members again um so yeah we've been we've been very fortunate from the financial side which i think if we weren't then the mental side of that would have been devastating do you know what i mean we, we've all got i mean i know double's got family um you know kids and whatever I've, I've got the same situation and it's like you know you still have to take care of that so i've been lucky and i've not been in a position to go and I don't know, get a job to do something else because it just wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it just just wouldn't have been viable financially. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to coming out. But, yeah, it's been been crazy. It's it's the same for everyone else. But I also feel like because we was on a bit of a stable footing, the last 10 years have been really good, that we've not had it anywhere near as bad as some other people have had. Mm -hmm. And I have to appreciate that. And I do appreciate that. I massively count my blessings. Someone was looking over us because we've managed to weather this horrible storm. But, you know, even for us, though, we're like, we need to be back open. We need to be earning money again. I mean, we're, we're trying to diversify through other things, but essentially we need to be back open again. And that's quite stressful. I was going to ask, like, how have you managed to, like, adapt? I've seen, I've seen you guys do some, like, bowling like events and some other bits and bobs like do you know what can i be really honest well please say what i think you're going to say because i'm going (laughs) to yeah i'm on board as well (laughs) some some of them some of them the outdoor stuff there's a venue that we did like last year that we did was all right it was really good actually people really enjoyed it because the venue was able to let people dance but this year it's been a lot more complicated right a lot more difficult to get away with doing stuff right um so again i don't want to have a gerald ratner moment and like put down anything we do but i was speaking to double earlier bro seated events Hmm. are just not the one do you know what i mean as much as we need to do them we want to do them and people are interested it's really hard to like say to someone pay x amount and sit down. Yeah. And I, it's not what we ever wanted to do. None of us have got into this to, to watch people sit down and eat some food and listen to, it, it, it's not ideal. It's that, that's the thing, it's not ideal. So if I'm really honest, um, it's frustrating, but we have to keep busy. We have to do stuff. From a DJ's perspective, listen, if you get a gig to do a brunch and even if everyone's sitting down and having a meal, so be it, yep. you need to do it, right? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it wasn't, you know, even, even like what, you, you know, some DJs doing the streams, we were talking about, you know, do we as bra- any of our brands, do we do streams? And then we just decided not to. I don't, I don't think it would have worked well for brands to be rolling out. But for DJs, I think it's one of the best things you could have done. Mm-hmm. Um, for some people, it's worked really, really well. I'm not saying it was right for everyone, but for some people, it's been a massive way to grow your brand and, you know, grow, grow awareness. But yeah, the last, yeah, doing events of this format, it's not for me, man. Especially when you look at the level of, like, gigs that you guys were doing. <coughs> like, you're talking yeah. huge arenas, and then all of a sudden you've got to have 200 people sat down and they can't kind of move. Yeah, like it's frustrating. It's... it's so frustrating. But I get it. I'm not, I'm not like, saying, oh, we should open up. Look, cool. The world's in a bad place. 
but can we quickly fix it? <laughs> <laughs> can we hurry up yeah, now, fix please? Fix it and let's get back Don't to hate. partying and yeah. celebrating. I'm, I'm glad to be DJing again, for sure. <laughs> like, even just out playing to humans. But it, for yeah. me, it feels like the soul is kind of just been pulled out of, of must what be DJing difficult, is. Man. Must be, I, I went to an event recently, right? And I probably left within an hour, hour and a half, because I was just like, I spoke to the people I needed to speak to. And then I was like, I'm not really enjoying this. Mm -hmm. I just left. Do you drink? Are you much of a drinker? No, oh, no, I don't drink. So that, but even that, would it, would it, it must be weird to drink in that environment. Yeah, drink sitting down and listen. When I'm get, when I'm drunk, I'm party. trying to move around the rave, man. I'm bouncing around, chatting to people. <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly in the and out same. The booth, like so out of like, control. I treat the club a, a like a bit, pinball a machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be honest, the older I get, brother, the, I'm going off the alcohol, man. I'm going off it, bro. Like I drink now, and it's like I'm hurt for days. Like it's not... I, I was um, we went out for a meal the other day, me, Martin, and CJ Beats, and. CJ was saying the same thing. He goes, like, he's he's become, well, I'm going to speak for him. He's, he's like, teetotal now, yeah? <laughs> bro, he's, he's not teetotal, but, you know, man really takes care of himself and looks after himself. And he was just like, yeah, I can't do the drinking thing as much. That's crazy because CJ used to get it in at Jam back in the day. I remember <laughs> coming out of the club at 7 a.m. with CJ. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the biggest party DJ is in your city, bro. Oh, mate. Don't How he does it, I don't know. I, I can't hang around with that guy anymore oh, for this reason. He's, he's dangerous. He's dangerous. <laughs> I've, I've, <laughs> yeah, we don't even need to say his name. Uh, no, we, we know. We've had, he's, a legend. he's come he's up a, a million legend. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, anyway. no. So. Uh, it's... Um... Well. <laughs> yeah. too. Yo, anyway, I, need, I was going to ask you something. I wrote it down when you was talking about it before. You was mm. mentioning, Hanif, about what the, when you came through and you was a bit bit more of like a the quiet type, the quiet character. Like, obviously, as promoters, most of them are known to be these live, busted characters, go around, kind of talk to everyone. How did you approach building, like, this following without actively being, like, the, the loud guy? Obviously, there's a lot of dope DJs out there that may, be, they may fall on the quieter side. And yeah. and wonder like would they would they ever be able to kind of like approach events and go down the route kind of like you took like what was your approach to tapping in and not being um, the loud the loud the loud chap? I've always had really really good teams. I've been part of good teams. It's not never been me. Um, um, and opportunities, certain opportunities. Obviously, if you work with a certain brand, then you can move forward. You know, and that's that's still the same now, right? The big, the big, the big difference for me was when Trevor approached me and said, "Do you want to DJ the lick parties?" Lick parties were, uh, you know, again before you you guys time, but no, I, I remember still... the lick parties briefly. Okay, but my mum used you to, may go not to have gone to one, though, <laughs> it? You may not <laughs> no, have gone. No, no, to I one. never went. I never right. went. Unfortunately, so I, I can't think of a brand that has competed with that. And to be honest, whether it was luck or engineered. I was very fortunate to be a part of that, to be asked to be a part of that. And that made a massive difference to me being able to DJ. It opened doors. Listen, if you say that you work with Trevor Nelson, doors open, mate. Yeah, just doors <laughs> open. Yeah, I, I have so much respect for people I work with, but ultimately he's been one of the most important people in my career. Um, and he's always been helpful. But I've, I've had some great people. Be Matt White was really, really helpful, really important when I came out of uni. Um, when I was at uni, there's this, I mentioned my friend, my, my friend Mix, he was a promoter on the scene. He brought me into so many things. I could turn around, he, he would probably say, yeah, but you was a good DJ, that's why we wanted to book you. But you know what, he didn't need to book me because sometimes people book DJs because they can sell tickets. I couldn't mm. sell tickets, mm. right? So I respect him. Um, when I worked, when I first got the job at um, my first proper West End gig um, was because I was working in Uptown Records and downstairs in the house department, Ronnie Harrell used to work there. And Ronnie Harrell, who was on oh. One Extra and now is on My Soul, Ronnie, he was known for doing, playing house at that time, Soulful House and whatever, but he used to run a Friday night in a club called Bar Rumba. And as, as I got to know him, he just said, which was an R&B club on a Friday, he said, look, and it was ram. He said, once a month, you can 
you can warm up. So Ronnie used to do the main set. He'd have a warm up DJ before him, then the main set, and then he'd have a guest on rotation. And Ronnie is the reason I met Trevor Nelson. Because Ronnie and Trevor were good mates and Ronnie used to book him once a month. And on the, on the week that he would book Trevor, I would then be the warm up. Okay. So all these things kind of just, just happen. The orga- they happened organically and I was just really fortunate to be able to capitalize or whatever, but it was never like, there was no plan or thought, thought out. Um, but yeah, essentially there's been really, really significant people. Mitz, Ronnie Harrell, Matt White, Trevor, Martin. I met Martin when I went to DJ at his uni. And then when he finished uni, he wanted to carry on DJing. And he bugged me for a job. <laughs> yes, I was a promoter right. then, yeah? By then I was a promoter. Um, I was running ministry, the student matter ministry. And Martin came along. And you know what? He was the guy that... Um, could go and speak to everyone because I didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. So as much as Martin might think, oh, Hanif gave me a bring in, mate, Martin, Martin helped me out because I didn't want to speak to students. I didn't want to speak to anyone. <laughs> right? Before like, that, you put him but, on the front line, mate, essentially. Yeah, 100%, but he I was good that. at it. He, he was good at it. He was brilliant at it. Uh, before that, there was another friend of mine. I had, I've always had good teams, you know. I've always had good teams around me. So as a promoter, when I was at uni, it was my housemates. Then... Do you know what I mean? When I moved on, um, I had another group of friends, um, Aaron and Yogi. We did we did some events together, and it was always I'd be the music guy, they'd be the guys that were the party people that knew everyone. Got you right. right. Yeah, yeah. Then it was an, then after them lot, there was a guy, two guys called Del and Ash. They were my partners. So I've always had a wicked team, and now I've ended up with Louis, like who's amazing at what he, what we do. So I, I've been fortunate or I've been good at spotting the right people, but I've just always had amazing team and, and amazing people helping me. So see so that saying teamwork makes the dream work. Like that sounds that's super legit, right? That's it. That's yeah. no, do you know what? If I that's look at proof. everything that I've done, <clears throat> it is because of the people around me. Okay. I'm not someone, there are some people who can just do everything on their own and they're brilliant. That ain't me. When you look at when you look at from when you started and did your first um, first gig as a promoter to now, the way that everything's changed, even from like the music styles and the music trends, and also the way that social media almost dictates how things are promoted now, has much changed for you as a promoter, or have you just had to make like the little tweaks? Um, I think over the period, it's been little tweaks, but if you go right to the start to now, right. massive, massive. Yeah. Um, well, I always tell the story like. When I was first promoting, obviously you had flyers. My first event, that, that one where I made 400 quid, me and this guy shared eight hundred quid. Got right. the street teams out and that. <laughs> oh, school. You, 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 have, you ever um, designed a flyer on Word? <laughs> you designed a flyer on Word. You put four up on an A4, went to a photocopy shop in town centre, printed it on red paper because we thought that was freaking cool. Black print on paper. <laughs> got a guillotine. Went back to the uni library, got the guillotine, cut them into four four flyers, four A sixes, and then went round and like you know, at the canteen, wherever, wherever we just flyered. Right. Fast forward to about seven or eight years ago. Oh no! Even when I started Milkshake, the student night that we run, which is like 16, 17 years old years old yes we were still flying we were in halls doing the posters and then there came a point where social media became the best way to promote didn't need now we don't print flyers we don't have a street team it's all done on social media and and louis was one of the main people for for that change he came along just think this you both do freshers events when we were doing freshers events in the early days I couldn't sell a ticket until the kid came to uni mm-hmm. right, in September, September the 15th. It will be the second or third week of September. They'd land in uni. That's when you'd sell tickets. Come on, then, yeah. In the last 10 years, in the last seven or eight years or 10 years. Man sold out months in advance or something. We sold out months in advance. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Crazy. Like, by the time they get to uni, they've got their first month of events. All tickets bought. Their parents have bought them at home. It's, it's so different. 
it's so different when you look at the studio stuff. And even like, say the concerts, it's all done on social media, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't need, there was a time when I was spending thousands on poster campaigns. What for? Is that it. even the case with like 112 events? And I know you do some of the, like, uh, I don't yeah. want to say older R&B, but you know, yeah, like the Jones heritage and, Jones and stuff like that. We do a lot artists, of the heritage artists, right? So yeah, yeah, but it's different, right? So I would say, say Trevor's audience is older now, right? Similar mm. age, right? They're all on Facebook. They're not necessarily on Instagram. So right. we still work on it on Facebook. Okay. Right. But if okay. I'm doing student stuff or I'm doing something young and urban, it's all on Instagram. Or now it's moving on to TikTok. So TikTok, it, it, yeah. there's different platforms which are right for different audiences. Um, but yeah, it, it's, still, it's still changed. We've got great tools for it now. Well, like, I just kind of, I used to love just the, the, the old style, like being on, being on the ground, do you know what I mean? Putting in that footwork, actually meeting all these ravers firsthand. And like, even when we did our last um, Monday night student thing, we would, we would go around and try and bump heads with everyone and build that little rapport the same way we did with Jam. And that kind of helped us. Obviously now you can just tap in online and you can sell these tickets, but you don't get to bump heads no. with these people. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like one way we've built our events is, actually making it's friends actually, with the ravers kind of thing yeah, like yeah. and building a, a little community vibe and that's always Martin, been martin still martin still claims uh and me and martin always have this conversation <laughs> um he still thinks you know that's still the best way and it's true if you can marry both if you can mm -hmm. do both if you can do the social media stuff and then you can do the face-to-face -face, the one-to-one -one, then you've got a winning yeah combination I think a lot of people will never, ever, ever know the pain of standing outside a club from 3 a.m. till 5 Rough. with thousands of flyers and Rough. trying to get but, but, every single person. Like, But you say pain. I loved it. Martin, Martin, again, Martin will say, mate, if, if you know what I mean? It, it is such a vibe. And, like, we learn how to sell stuff. Like, how am I going to make you? You guys have done the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. How am I going to connect with this punter coming out who goes, oh, I don't want to fly out? You know, you learn how to, even though I'm a quiet guy, I've learned over the years what to say. And if I'm on, if I, you know, if I'm in a really good mood, I will get a fly in everyone's hand, even to this day. And it's, and it's taught me some really valuable lessons about how to sell things. Mm -hmm. there's, a there's a technique to it, man. That's like, you come out of the club and you see them dudes giving out the flyers and just kind of, like, you've oh, got, you got to have something about you, man. Like, we'll be chopping 100. it up, like, and then, then the more willing to like, do you know what I mean? You got to give them a little something. But I think that's where you learn to read the people as they're coming out and which people to target with it. You, you, so True. what we did and especially actually, yeah, I say there was a pain in giving out flyers, but we actually probably 2010 times, we used to put on a lot of uh, events at the end of the summer. So after like, you know, like the Iron Napa reunions and cosmic yeah, yeah. reunions and that sort of stuff. And so it was still quite warm that time of night coming out of the club. And we would literally pick, a group of girls so okay cool and um, so i'm not trying to get every single one of them a flyer and then the next people that's it they're the ones i've chosen i'm giving them flyers i'm chatting with them and then a little bit of banter and i'm um, make sure you put the flyer in your bag so you find it tomorrow and so i'm there so they don't drop it on the floor i actually make them put it in their bag so they find it the next day we're chatting and do you know what i mean it's all of yeah. that and just connecting with them oh, so it's not just a here you go and obviously it must have got better when you lot was started doing your mix cds because mm -hmm. it's yeah same. helping you as well not just yeah. the event. So yeah, no, no, I think, I think as much as it, you, but you're right. If it was in the middle of December and it was freezing cold, yeah, yeah. it's a different one. <laughs> I've done that and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I've seen Martin tweet before like, and he, he loves all that stuff, right? Like he, he, I, I, I used to see you guys would fully banter each other on socials. Like I don't think you do it as much anymore, but I used to see you all going at it on Facebook and, and yeah, whatever yeah. else. And you got that little, that little vibe of me. Do you know what? Can I, can I, like, I, I don't know how you lot will view it, right? But he's like, obviously, like, he's my, he's like my little brother, right? And we work together. I've got so much respect for him because even to this day, because do you know what? You must have found this, right? Sometimes when you're flyering, especially because of who you are, oh, you're flyering, something like that. And it's like, so, it, it's such a derogatory kind of comment. People, by look, down, people look down on you for flyering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. how it feels. Yeah, and you're just like, I had, do you know what I had recently, you know, about, well, not recently, but just before lockdown. So if I have to, and I, and I haven't got someone around, and I'm just sitting there going, nah, this thing needs to be done. 
it's not as it's not as much as it used to be, but it still can happen, right? So I went and flyered something. For, this is obviously before lockdown. I can't remember what it was for. I think it was a concert or something. And this girl came out who was drunk, who used to work for me about 15 years ago. Oh, right? No. Wow. <laughs> she came out of this club and, you know, drunk, laughing. Oh, you still flying. And you know what? I know her. I know her husband now. I know who they are. And I really wanted to make a smarmy comment because it really <laughs> got to me. It really, really got to me that, like, you think I'm some kind of donut because I'm giving a flyer. But actually... I, I, I had to stay, take a step back and go, do you know what, cool, say what you're going to say. It doesn't really matter. I know who I am and I know what I'm doing. But that, they, that, that does get to be... And I remember, like, it used to... Sometimes, people used to do that to Martin a lot because he would go, no, no I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fly. Oh, do you mean to fly? This is like when he was already on the... You know, he wasn't just on the come up. He was doing bits and pieces. Even now, where he is in his career, if I said, come on, Martin, let's go and fly this thing, Nine he, times out of ten, he'll go, it. come on and let's do it, <laughs> right? Because he thinks it's funny, right? Or he just still likes that interaction with people. But there are, you know, obviously, you know, there are some people who like to think, oh, I'm better than him because he's giving out a flyer. It's like, oh, Real talk. But yeah, no, no, no. So I, I've got so much time for people like him who he's like, it's mine, I'll, I'll do that. Mm. Th this is the thing. Someone's got to do it. Do you know what I mean? And if and if it's one of your own like events or it's within your business and you haven't got you some, some, sometimes you have you not hired get... people? Have you not hired people to do it who don't give a crap? Yeah, who just sit there yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember one time, yeah, we had, a bunch, of, up, right? we had a bunch of guys doing it and they dumped the flyers, man. Worse, it was it was worse, after yeah. that, it was after that time, like I realized like we're just gonna get we'll get this shit done ourselves. Like, if it, if yeah. you ever find someone, I, I guarantee you this, if you ever find people who are really good at flyering, yeah. They'll be good workers, man. They'll always be good people. Yeah, I, I've found that they're just honest. They just do their thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I've got nothing but respect for people who do the street team and they do it properly and they do it well. They got all the fun. And they're hard to find, though, isn't it? Yeah, real, real it's, talk. Especially now. <laughs> especially yeah, yeah, yeah. now. Yeah, no one wants to do it now, bro. Flyering's no, flyering's yeah. dumb. They you still see the, the posters going up, like you still see all the poster <clears> campaigns around Manchester and stuff, but it's. More for like the bigger concerts and whatever else. Like yeah, yeah. Get back to it, so. I, don't, I don't even think it's legal in Brighton anymore. I remember a, quite a while back there was a there was a law passed in Brighton basically, and no one could fly. And then I think, yeah, that, I think then I it changed. You had to get a license. License, to fly that's out. right. But there was a period where it was no flying. So oh. doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> yeah, <You just> get <laughs> stylist to make it some video content. <laughs> this guy. This yeah, guy. there you go. Waiting for the Say day that Eve hires me to make some videos. <laughs> Mate, right, your videos, yours, G2, you guys do some dope stuff, man. Oh, thank you, both. We're chatting. We're, chatting. We're le learning a new trade through the pandemic. Yeah, reskilling, yeah, just I, like I Boris should said. really have done that, you know, at least learn how to do like the very basic edits. That's another thing. As a promoter, right? You guys both, obviously both of you Have you ever tried to design flyers? <sighs> uh, mine's mine flyers. are very, very, very hit and miss. For me oh, to mate, be honest, I get cussed for it. <laughs> Louis, Louis, I, I stopped even doing little edits, yeah, because Louis just went, Your stuff's rubbish. Because I thought I was quite good. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm doing all right. And he just put me to bed. He went, No, man, your stuff's whack. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's important to, when you know your strengths, to outsource the weaknesses, <laughs> definitely. So getting a fly, if you know you're crap at doing flyers, get a fly designer. Yeah. Then they can, yeah, 100%. Like, Get it done. I used to try the flyers and, and the artworks, and then I soon realized like my, my, my strength was in videos. I was like, leave, I'll leave the we'll leave the flyer into the to the guys that yeah, used to do it initially. Okay. So mm, interesting. Uh yo, bruv, Hanif, there was an interesting debate on Twitter the other day, right? Like I thought I'd run this by you. As a promoter that's been in the game for a long time and has booked so many DJs and, and artists and stuff. This debate was about promoters. Um, right, let me go through this. I like these. It was about promoters booking headline DJs and how maybe it's not always the best angle spending thousands of pounds on this headline and then they come to the club and Can't maybe do don't have the effect or bring the vibe as much as, say, like a local resident was and they were putting headlines against residents and... <laughs> going through the pros and cons between them. Like, has there been times for you where 
you've gone big on like a headline DJ and maybe it's not gone how you felt and you probably look at it and think maybe the resident DJ could have brought yeah. the same thing to the table. It was an interesting debate, man. It was going on forever. I couldn't even write down all the points, but I just thought you'd be a really good person to ask with the amount of people that you probably booked throughout your, your career. Yeah, I, I think that's a, there's a valid conversation to be had around it. Um... It's a, it's, it's a, it's a it, tough it, one. Do you know what? It, it just depends what you want out of the booking. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? Um... I've definitely had Did you have examples we, of DJs that were mentioned then? Were they, did they uh, have examples? There was a couple, but I didn't want to start names. I didn't, I didn't That's start what he names said. He said, <laughs> name some names. I, I've actually got personal experience with this as well. I'm not going to chuck anyone under the bus, but there's definitely been times where we've gone big on like a headline and, and it's been an absolute what? train wreck. You know, it's and a safe space, thinking, bro. You can throw uh, everyone under the bus. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that today. <laughs> Whilst double says nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Double, double always space, says bro. drop names, but then oh. when, it, when, it come, when, it, when it's on he, the he other foot, he doesn't foot, talk. Yeah, he does. a mouse, bro. <laughs> this guy. But yeah, there's, well, been, I mean, there's been times when we've done it, and then we're like, do you know what? Like, our local, our, like, our resident would have fucking lenged it 20 times more. But are you general. talking about the job that they do on the night, or should we discuss... Bums on seats selling tickets. It's a combination it's a balance, of both. Isn't it? it's a, yeah, it's a combination of both. It's a if you can have a DJ that can sell tickets and can do the job, great. But there are some times when you have to book someone because they will put bums on seats, but they might not be the best DJ. There, there is, you know what? So we all know the best DJs aren't necessarily the ones that are known mm -hmm. and the ones that can put 500 people in your club. Oh, but you got you got to have a bat as a promoter. You've so it's different, right? So if I take my student night for example, it's there every Tuesday. It's a regular night. I need people to return, right? I want people to return. So I put on the best DJs. Doesn't the DJs? It's not important that they're known or not known, right? You develop good residents. It's just like anyway. If you have a residency, if you if you're a club that's got a residency, yeah, you might throw in a guest just to kind of bump up the numbers once in a while which is what they all do, or an artist that comes in. But in general, you need really good residents, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that, that is always the case. But there are sometimes anomalies where you have someone that can sell tickets, but actually doesn't do a great job. So what, you know, what do you do? You don't focus on, you won't do that event too often. You won't book that DJ too often. But every so often, you might need to book him. It's, um, there's no right or wrong answer, but essentially, and anybody who's worked with me will tell you, I'm all about the DJ being good. DJ's oh. got to be good. I am ne I, I, I hope someone doesn't come creep out and say <laughs> that I'm wrong, I'm lying. But I don't think I've ever booked a DJ because I said, you can sell 50 tickets, yep. but, you're, you're, you know, but you can't mix a bowl of sweets. Nah, I've never, I've avoided that, always avoided that. To my detriment where people have said, oh, but no one knows who he is. Why are you booking him? Doesn't matter. Yeah. I know he does a really good job. That's crazy. Uh, we, we we did the same thing as you, Hanif. Like we we had one or two where it completely nosedived, and we were like, right, we need to rethink this strategy and just mess with. Like we we get people through the door anyway, so it wasn't a case of selling seats. The the, the venue was always full. So after that, our focus was to be on the quality of the set, and we just started booking residents and local DJs from other cities around us that we knew were dope. But I mean, they're not the headliner or whatnot, but they've got a little bit of a vibe within their city. Yeah. So that's how we managed. We started building a little. DJ community all across the UK and bringing them through. They weren't as expensive, um, but we would show them a great time, look after them, and they would absolutely shell it in return. And we never, we never went big on DJs after that, to be honest. We stopped. I think that's the important thing for promoters, though, is to make sure that the residents are top quality. Mm -hmm. And then if you get a guest, like with your with your example, Stylus, like if you get a guest that's just kind of like a, I'll just say an unknown, no disrespect to anybody, I've, I've even played there, but you know what I mean? Like not, not like a headliner ticket selling person, but someone mm -hmm. that can come in and shell it, it just adds to the extra quality. But the same way with your events, Hanif, like if you've got a big headliner that's going to sell out the event, but they're just mediocre with the set, at least if you sandwich them with really, yeah. really dope residents, the overall night is going to be a great experience. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So. Agreed. Um, but what do you do, man? People are so fickle. If they want to see someone who they like off social media, 
they don't sometimes they don't even care like if they're a good dj or not I was, mm -hmm. it's not all the conversation is it do people really it's, care about good djs too much anymore like we we, we speak about this quite a lot don't we double it comes like, up loads <clears throat> yeah you know what we, we've always i'm sure we've all had the conversation like you just sometimes need a jukebox man people just <laughs> these punters don't do you know what that's that's something that definitely has changed, right? In my time. I was about to ask this. Yeah, yeah when we used to DJ, right? Like early in my career, like when I played the bar rumba for Ronnie, or I used to go as a punter to Hanover Grand. Fresh and Funky is still for me, the most iconic legendary night. Wednesday night, Ram, DJs who were sick and you might hear Buster's first record, new record for the first time in the club, the and you would go nuts, man. The best nights. right? Or when Trevor and Ronnie used to do, uh, and a guy called JP used to do Villa Stefano as a night called Club Yo Yo, right? Connoisseurs' night, yeah. Older people listening to, you know, we used to play Myron in a club. I don't know if you know that record, Myron. We can get down, bro. These are soul records, hmm. but now. I feel like so many clubs, you have to play the top 20, whatever they are. And sometimes in certain clubs, you, you have to play the same record three times in a night. I know you guys are going to disagree with that because you're proper DJs. That's not, but, or, or, you know, you're DJs, DJs, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying, I could understand why some DJs might have to play the same mm -hmm. Bieber record three times in a night. Yeah, it's very rare these days that you can go to events and play like you just said that the, the album caught off the new Buster project. Oh, or, like, it just doesn't, it, it very rarely happens. Like even, even now we're playing to people sat down. I feel like the warm, the art of the warm up has kind of been washed out a little bit because you need to entertain these people as soon as they're in, because they're just sat down yeah, in the seats. Yeah, yeah. So even I've even found myself adapt to like the warm up where we'll do that kind of stuff, a couple left field album cuts yeah. or whatever, and filter some new stuff in. I'm finding myself having to just go harder a little bit earlier. Like it's, how do you think it's going to be when they open up? What's your... Because I, I, I tweeted something the other day. Um, Santero, I think it was Santero, like he, he tweeted something about how DJing has already changed, how he already feels like it's changed. A bit like what you're, you just said. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, how do you think it will be whenever this first night is, when it's back to normal? When I, went to, when I, when I initially went back to the clubs, I was thinking... Well, the bars, it's not even the clubs yet. I was like, yo, all this new music throughout the last year, we're going to get to go in and kind of just let all this new stuff off. Oh, I couldn't be in there. I couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> oh, that's oh. exactly what he said. I'm sure that's exactly what he said in the tweet. It's like, you thought you could play all these new records. No, they still want the same stuff they heard in they, 2019. They, yeah. they still want all the old <clears throat> shit, man, that was that was doing the bits before before the lockdown hit, like all the new stuff. It, it, I was playing like the, the new Burner Boy joint, for example, like Kilometer Track, which is just one of the waviest records out right Rhythm. now. Bro, it is nosedived every time I've played it. <laughs> Man, are looking at me like, what is this guy playing? I'm trying to keep the energy up. People are looking at me like I'm like I'm not well. It's I'd... There's a small handful of tunes that dropped over the last year, specifically this year, mm. that have dominated. Like the one we actually we chatted about this last week's episode, the uh, Tion Wayne and Rush tune, uh, Body. Body record, yeah. I mean, that's under, it was number one anyway, so it's going to, I think, and this is another thing we've covered before, a lot of the TikTok big records have translated to club sets. Right. Ones with the little dance routines and stuff. That Even though sense. people can't dance, I think it's because it's just the familiarity. It's the ones mm -hmm. they've just been vibing to. It's the ones that have been absolutely flooded all over social media. So it's just, that's how people have been getting their exposure to music, really, isn't it? But maybe in a way, this is reinforcing the fact how, even though we seem to think my generation of DJs, oh, DJs don't break records. Maybe you guys did break records. And because you've not had the ability to do that in the last 12 months, records haven't been broken in yeah, the clubs. Sure. As much as like we, we assume that, no, you don't break records, maybe you guys were breaking records. Mm -hmm. And this last year has proved that, that because you've not been in the club playing those records, the audience hasn't cottoned on. I think that's right to some extent, mm -hmm. but I think um, I think the DJs evolved to be breaking club records specifically. Yeah. And 
but not just the DJs. It was always helped by social media using NSG's. Um, what was it at the time? I think it was options. Yeah, with the, with the little dance. And what happened was there was like a 30 second clip of options came out on social media that they put out and a couple of DJs ripped the audio and started playing that in the club. And then other people were on their social media, which made it go viral before the song had even left the studio. I think, Do you know what I mean, no one really even had it. So that DJ in the club or the DJs that were playing it in the club were responsible for creating the hype around it. But without social media, it wouldn't have been possible. I think it's harder to break records in clubs now as well. Like obviously we all do the whole sandwich technique and we flirt, flirt new bits in and surround it by bangers and whatnot. I just feel like uh, it also depends on the night, obviously, but majority of these nights we play now, it's harder to put new music onto people because they kind of just well, follow like, the crowd. Like the, the It's very sheepy now, man. Like I feel like people need to be told what they're enjoying and then everyone else yeah. kind of enjoys it. Like we'll play a hit in the club months before it drops, they might look at you like you're funny. As soon as that becomes the record and it's done the radio rounds or it's commercially known, they're all of a sudden jumping around about it. So it's definitely harder. The art of breaking new music is, is, is tougher now, man. Definitely. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those guys. Oh, you've got to break me. At the end of the day, people are there to enjoy themselves. It's, they're not there to be educated as, as such. Mm -hmm. If you can, if great. But ultimately, people are out to have a good time. Exactly. It's just the mentality was different. Like I can, I can honestly say, the first time I heard Mary J. Blige "Be Happy" was in a club. It wasn't on radio, but wow. had, someone had the test press or the, the the promo when it was a big deal to have promos, right? Um, and, and then played it for the first time, and then it was just like, wow. What a time to be alive, man. Mum was in the club when Mary J. B. Happy got broken. That is yeah, like, it was crazy. Sick. That it is was epic. Crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> um, people like Matt used to get promos first. Yeah. DJ Swing, God rest his soul. Bro, he he was breaking records. Like He used to work at BMG, right? Sony BMG. And SWV were one of his artists. He was, he was working in the pro marketing and promotion department. But he was obviously one of the dopest DJs. And so... I, I think I'm pretty sure I remember him playing a test press of like SWV's remix of you know the one I need or something. I can't remember, but yeah, in a club, and you're like, that that is never gonna happen again, which is fine, yeah. which is fine. But it's just like it's a great memory. Do you find that the crowds back then were just way more patient with the music as well, and just willing to absorb new sounds? Like I feel feels like, like then you could let you could let records run a bit more. And feels it feels like it. Definitely it feels it. like it. Definitely feels like it. I can't be sure. And it's, you know, it's just like anything. Like, you know, was it better then? I would say so. But, you know, my son probably goes, nah, that's cool, man. We've done our dance. Verse and, verse and chorus. Move on to the next one. That, that's yeah. all it is now, isn't it, man? You get one verse, one chorus, and it's like yeah. in, in and out. Man will play a couple hundred records in a night these days. Like it's Yeah. There, there was a time when I used to like, because Westwood was one of the first to do that, you know? And I used to hate that. And I used to think, oh, just let the record play. But he was <laughs> that American to. style, right? Well, mm -hmm. his reason was he obviously was connected to Flex and all of them lot. So he picked up his style when he was out in the States. And it works for him. I, I, listen, I got utmost respect for him, right? But as a someone who wanted to consume the music, I used to hate it. I was like, oh, a verse of chorus. <laughs> no, man, come on. But he was in and out. He was in and out. And now that's the culture. When I'm DJing, I do that with tunes quite often if it's a song that I've played loads. Especially when I'm doing like five, six bookings a week and you know there's the the, the certain pack of tunes that you know are definitely getting played every night. But yeah. if I'm in the club as a customer, I, I, it annoys me when a DJ does it. I'm like, I want to yeah. vibe to it, the, I the vibe to it a bit yeah. more. Like, <laughs> I, know what the I know what the problem is here because we play the same songs a lot and we, like, like you say, four or five nights a week. We might play the song five nights in a row and then we're like oh shit we'll mix it out so quick because to us we've drained it's been drained more of it. yeah that's well, what you, i'm saying yeah you yeah. forget like you kind of have to have that out of body experience and sit yourself yeah. on the floor for a second and think from their point of view yeah, yeah let yeah. the song breathe a, a little bit I'm de i've definitely i've been told off for that before to be fair like stylist man just let, it, it, let, let it's it, hard let it breathe, though, let it breathe a little bit come on yeah it's hard though isn't it you live and breathe that music like you say you might play certain records four or five times a week the punter who's in the is in the dance doesn't have that same experience with that music. No. So they do want to hear it the whole way through. So 
it's it's tough for you guys, man. It's, 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 but having wasn't jam about you not necessarily breaking new music, but playing music that ain't just like the commercial twenty and just 100%. going. And it'd be nice to see nights like that, because when when like the internet started coming in, I remember there was a point right, um, where I become lazy as a DJ, right? And I used to do this residency um, at a university, Warwick University, right? And this was when uh, file sharing was really, really just coming into its own. Now, being a gigging DJ, I wasn't on LimeWire, I wasn't on any of these things trying to find new music, right? <laughs> And it started to become really annoying because, all right, cool. I was working in record shop. I was getting promos, but now it moved from promos to like records being leaked so early on like LimeWire or whatever. I remember like kids who were like obviously tech savvy coming up to me at the DJ going, oh, have you got this record? I'm like, I don't even know that record. <laughs> so, I thought, so I thought this would help clubs mature in the audience would come and want to hear new music but actually over the period oh because that's probably like 10 15 years ago right now it just feels like it's gone backwards so even though they've got access to loads of new music mm -hmm. they still want the same that's yeah that's crazy it's like they're, 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 they're less open and and to, to new music i'd i'd sort of disagree with that just in the sense that Double some odd. of my experiences <laughs> now some of my experiences with them is because the way that music has been opened up and you have access to everything. When when I started, for example, so let's just say, um, <clears throat> let me pick a time. All right, so like 2005 sort of time, when like Lean Back was a big song in the club, I remember. Yeah. Those nights that we were playing at in Brighton were very specifically hip hop R&B nights. They didn't even really have that much dancehall influence and Afrobeats was mm. nowhere to be seen at this point. So it was very much hip hop, rap, R&B, that's what you got. Sometimes if it was summer, you might get a bit of garage, but that's where it was. The people that listen to house music, they're never coming in that club, they're down there. The guys at drum and bass, they're, they've got another place down there. Do you know what I mean? So the specific nights and the fans just had access to that music and that's what they liked that's where they were they never really mixed but then when streaming opened up and when youtube music got really big and stuff and people were exposed to more music easily suddenly i've got someone in the club coming up to me saying oh can you play some vibes cartel like oh yeah i'm gonna do that in a bit oh okay well in that case can you play some armand van helden now instead and it's like how how do we get from vibes cartel to armand how is that person listening to both of those types of music does that make sense so they're they're coming in and especially the people that like house music that also were are fans of black music mm. house music fans seem to be so open to new music they'll be coming in and asking for like brand brand new stuff yeah i think yeah you're probably right but i'm just saying like my my the thing that i was saying is like i'm just concentrating on people that like like black music right right i just even think in black music clubs now there is this where i think you've got you've got access to more music than we've ever had mm -hmm. but they're still quite closed in what they want to hear when they're in a club 100%. i might be wrong like you might say no 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 i can get away with testing them out with an album track but i just don't think you can anymore no i agree mm. i agree i agree with you hanif i feel like all of the quests are always the same it's always the same shit like it's always the same and the, there might be the one time maybe like one request out of like a whole month where someone will ask you for, someone will ask you for something completely <laughs> different and you're like bro i love you thank like thank well, you. i can't you know play I mean? it because if i play it everyone will look at me like a the everyone leaves <laughs> <laughs> yeah. even now with people sat down like you you're under even more pressure because like a couple of songs and like you say people are sat down anyway so it's not the same energy People are getting up and leaving, not just because of the, the, the DJ, it's because an hour or two, and it's it's semi uncomfortable. Like, you know, it's, yeah. I went out as a punter last weekend with the missus and some friends, and after like an hour or two, I'm like, this is not the one. I'm like, I'm, I'm out. Unfortunately, that's that is the case. Back door, it's back door it. <laughs> anyway, um, how's things with milkshake anyway, Hanif? Like, we've not even touched on it. Like, probably the, um, the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> it is the biggest student night in the UK, right? It is. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's We've great, got man. On it. It's great. It's great. It's like, um, see, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I do things across the spectrum, right? Um, 
So I've got at one end, we're doing old school nights and, you know, loads of like 90s and noughties. I love soul. I love 80s soul. I do some nights that, that do that. But what's really, really beautiful is being able to be a part of something that is always youth orientated. So, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm still connected to new music always. And I, like I'm in my mid 40s. Yeah. And I'm still connected. I know what's hot. I know what's going on. I know what art is to book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it keeps you kind of match fit, man, having a student night. It really, really does. Even for you guys as a DJ, you could quite easily not be doing student nights and just focus on, you know, what's maybe age appropriate to you. But mm -hmm. like, you'd be lost. Um, so yeah, Milkshake is a great institution. I'd be gutted if it ever, you know, wasn't around. Um, but it, 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 yeah, it's brilliant, man. And, and being a part, being involved with, 18 year olds and seeing what they want and tr always trying to be up on what they want is really, really, it's good. It's good for you, man. Must definitely keep you on your toes. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, you won't see me in the club because they'll be like, this is someone's uncle. What's he doing here? But <laughs> I'll be in the office. Yeah, he's behind like, the scenes now. You're, not, you're the yeah, office guy. 100%, 100%. Even like, you know, but yeah, it, it's, it's brilliant, man. It's like Ministry of Sound is one of the, it, for me, my favorite club in this country. Uh, without a doubt, proper nightclub. You know, mm. they treat the DJs like they should be treated. The sound is amazing. 27 I've... CDJs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, that's the thing. The equipment. The and equipment if you want, if there, if you want yeah. the 1210s, the 1210s are they're sound. There. No yes. problem. Whatever mix you want, you've got. Um, there's a couple of venues like that. I mean, it's not just ministry, but I love, you know, it, 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 it's, it's got a, I've got a soft place for it in my, in my heart, but uh, and, and the guys that work with me there is brilliant. You know, Martin's still DJs for us. Andy's still DJs for us. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We've got um, a relatively new resident in the kind of commercial room, Bluck. I don't know if you guys know Bluck. He's a sick DJ as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's mine and Louis' baby, man. It's, it's, it's the thing. Because it's, you know, it's not 52 weeks a year, but because it's pr practically every single week, um, you know, Does it run outside of student time as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it never okay. used to, but yeah, then, then we developed it into being outside of student time. And obviously when everything was meant to open up on the 21st, on Monday, the 21st of June, um, our it's first party... Tuesday was, night, isn't it? Yeah, so our first party was going to be Tuesday, the 22nd of June. It sold out straight away. I mean... What a night of the week to have one of the biggest nights, like on a night where great, nothing, man. like a Tuesday in Manchester, <clears> bro, of like... But you know what? You know what? There was That's a time when... ghost. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, you know, we've, we've, there's been periods throughout the 16, 17 years where we were competing. I mean, you you guys remember Rough Hill. Rough Hill mm. came to London. Made wow, it Rough Hill. Us. Wow. Yeah, mm. they made it difficult for us for a few years because we had it all to ourselves for such a long time. Um, and you guys had them in Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, no. We've had ups and downs, but it's it's been a constant. And, and it is so good. You both know this, yeah? when you work with everybody is brilliant on point. The venue, security, my DJs, all of our staff are amazing. Like it, it is such a great gig, it's man. Perfect, and, and, it sounds and like you've got the perfect marriage there, bro. To it it yeah. really, really is. And I've been very fortunate with that. And you know what, even how I got that night is just laughable, but it, it, here we are. Can, can, um, we, can, we, can, we, can we touch on that? Like how does one manage to land their own event residency in a club like Ministry of Sound? Like, was it a case of just getting your stripes up and building through the ranks? Like you said, there's natural progression. Or, yeah, it was like, a natural ministry, progression. It's not, it's not a, like, no. not anyone can get their hands on that. And I didn't approach them, they approached me, right? And it's, oh. this, this is it, right? Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but the reason, I'll, I'll tell you the reason, yeah, and you'll laugh your heads off, yeah? So they used to do a Wednesday night. There used to be a night called... There's a promoter from Leeds. I, I, I don't know if you guys work in Leeds at all, but there used to be a student promoter called Taking Liberties, right? Yeah, I've, is, I've, worked, I've worked for them a couple of times. Right, okay, okay. So the original <laughs> guy who ran that 20 years ago, he came to London. I, I don't even know the guy. I don't know the guy. Um, and he approached Ministry. I, I can't remember what the night was called, but whatever the night was called. They used to do a Wednesday night. It was all right. It didn't write. Um going a bit deeper into the thing the guy pulled a fast one he shut his company down so he could avoid paying taxes or some some stuff like that 
and then he tried to reopen, bump the printer, bump all these suppliers, uh, maybe the DJs, no, I don't know. But I know right. he'd done all that, yeah. And then he tried to reopen and he approached ministry and ministry said, no, we're not working with you, man. He didn't bump them, obviously, but they just didn't like just bad vibes, his mentality. Man. Yeah, red they didn't there. like the energy. <laughs> but his two event managers that he brought to ministry, ministry then like really liked them. A guy called Ben uh, and a guy called Andy, right? And they were wicked. They were young guys. They both studied in Leeds and they worked for Taking Liberties up there. They came down to London to run it for the guy. I think the guy's name was Jim, who owned Taking Liberties. But anyway, they ran it on the ground. They didn't obviously have anything to do with like what this guy did in the background in the finances. They just were really young guys who were good promoters. And ministry just said, look, we'd like to take you guys on. And you guys will carry on doing a student night. Maybe someone might, you know, I might these days say, oh, that's a bit dodgy. You guys bumped this guy by saying that he was bumping everyone. But then you took on the, his staff and ran a student night. Um, so you know, maybe that's wrong as well. But they were running this student night. And I, at the same time, was running a student night in this club called Double May Have Played It. Have you ever played at a club called Trap on Wardour Street? No, I don't know. Okay, cool. Well, anyway, me and two friends were running this student night. Um, on a Monday, and it was doing really good numbers. It started off small, but we was doing good numbers. Now, the two guys who used to work for Taking Liberties and now are working for ministry, they'd been doing student nights for a couple of years. I think they hated it. Andy <laughs> was more and more interested in doing, working for the Saturday nights of ministry. He was a house guy, he really. He's now, he runs Saturday nights at Fabric. He went up the ladder, he became the guy that ran Saturday nights at ministry before that, right? So he, he didn't want to do student nights anymore. And then the other guy, Ben, he was, he's, he's like the smartest guy I've ever met, I think, right? Even though he's a promoter, he wanted to, he, the club said, look, we want you to train up to be a manager at the club. He started becoming a manager. And this is how my life is so weird, right? So we do, Trevor, me and Trevor did a party with Chris Brown. Chris Brown's first performance in the UK. Wow. Shout out to a guy called Mervyn Lynn. He approached Trevor and said, look, Chris Brown's coming in. We're promoting him to do Run It. This is when Run It was going to be a single. Right, okay. Chris Brown comes in. We want to do a party with him, right? So Trevor goes, so Hanif will do it, right? Cool. I, um, we'd, done a, we'd done a lick party at Ministry at this point, right? Um, and I met in passing this guy, Ben, who was the assistant manager at the club. I didn't know he ran the student night as well. Um, pleasantries, walked off, did the Chris Bound party, and obviously it went off. It was like amazing party. Chris Brown performed, first time performed. Da, 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 da. The lick party as well had Destiny's Child on the, when we'd done the lick party. So this guy, Ben, associated me with Trevor. <laughs> this is what I was saying. Trevor right. just makes things so yeah. nice. Then he found out that I did this Monday night. And we used to go and t apparently take his posters down, right? Ministries of Ben. <laughs> those guerrilla tactics. He, yeah, he'd yeah, go those he, him and Andy used to go around. They were meticulous, but we were just like jokers, innit? We would go around. Apparently, his posters were on the floor, but our posters would be up. So then he contacted me and said, look. <laughs> apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no comment. No. So he just, so he knew me from working with Trevor. He, he called me and he said, look, do you want to come in? And I wanted to have a meeting with you. I said, all right, cool. And he just said, look, man, I thought he was going to grill me because he first of all started saying, you know, we run the student night here. Our promo gets ripped down all the time. Da, 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 da. So I thought he brought me in to, you know what I mean? He, he, he's he's going to stitch me up here. But then he goes, rather than us compete, why don't you come on board and run that student night? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And I was... I, to be honest, we weren't in a good place to do that because we was just hustling, doing what we was doing. This was a big step. So then, first of all, he said, look, to make it easy, we'll, we'll be your partners, right? We'll partner up with you. It just means we're not competing with you. You don't do that other night. You come over here. You don't rip down our posters. <laughs> cool. I love that, man. I love that. Yeah, so, so that's how that happened. And like, wow. then over a period of time, the club just realised they had no interest in running it. We would, uh, me and my team would do all the work. 
So then we ended up taking it. They quickly realised that you were the guys, man. Just you. Do you know? Do you know what? Though, I, honestly, I don't even remember us pulling their posters down. But uh, whoever, whoever <laughs> did it, whoever did it, it's they. They. Do you know what I mean? They did. They, the deserve, they deserve a little cut. Yeah, you? they did the best thing for me. Man. Find that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Big shout out to that person who changed, <laughs> who changed my life in terms of promotions. Because, and as you guys know, do you know what? If you have a regular night, it just makes such a difference to. Mm-hmm. To how you run things, how business works, it's, and it's taught me so much working with ministry. I've worked with some great people at that club over the mm. time. So, yeah, no, it's been really good, and it's a great calling card even for the DJs. You know, Martin and Andy have done loads of ministry gigs, like outside of Milkshake. So yeah, it's just been it's been one of the most positive things. At that time, when that opportunity arisen, like you just said, like was it was it a case of just jumping feet first in the deep end? Like you say, you yeah. guys weren't fully ready for it. Yeah, just do it. I'm not going to say no. Exactly. You know what I mean? He, he, <laughs> yeah, why not? Do you know what? To this day, Ben and them lot thought we were better than we were. Do you know okay. what I mean? We were, but we're not going to tell him that. We're like, yeah, yeah, cool, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, I've got this. I say this all the time. Like everybody's semi winging it in life. Like when it comes to certain Andrew. things. Like, but some people are just better at styling out than others. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like I say, at the time, you guys weren't ready, but everyone thought you like you man were doing it way more than you actually were at the time. And look what where you ended up. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People always assumed that we was doing better than we were, and yeah, fake it till you make right. it, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of that, isn't it? There's definitely a lot of that. <laughs> how, this... how do you how do you stay hungry, Henny? Like with the success of the night over 17, 18 years, concert events, all the other bits and bobs, like you've been doing it for so long. Like, how do you keep the, the hunger up and to get up and go every morning to um, go do it again and do it again? Like after so many years I, of I, I don't think it's it's possible. Um you have to have new people in your business who reinvigorate that fire um, and they take it on. Like I say, the first, yeah, if I think back when Milkshake first started, first of all, there was, you know, a team of us, like ministry had had their, their guys. So Ben um, brought in somebody to, to work on his behalf because he was so busy on the, on, on the ministry's behalf. And then the, and at that point, I was super hungry, right? I was, because it was early doors. Um, and then after three, four years, I wanted to change the deal. Um, and that made me more hungry, right? When I knew that I could have 100% of it, that gave me a new fire for it. Then um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on milkshake mainly, but that gave me the fire. Then Martin came and joined, you know, when Martin joined the team, he was passionate about it. So his passion drove it. Louis passion drove it. There's been other members. Um, there have been so, so, and I've over the last six or seven years probably fallen off a little bit. Um, and this last year has definitely proved to me that even even before the pandemic, probably the last two years before the pandemic, I stopped going. The, like for the last for the first 14, 15 years, I I, I was at ministry every Tuesday. Mm. Um, the last three four years, I've not been going. I, I might go start of every term or you know whenever I'm needed if we need extra hands or something special is happening but you can't have that same energy for the same thing forever man you need new new people to reinvigorate it um certain things I'll never lose the love of like working with Trevor um I keep I keep turning up I mean we don't do as much as we might have done in the past but you know what it's my favorite gigs man we used to run a night, um, a monthly residency um, at Amira in London before lockdown. My favourite night, but that's because I got it was a crowd that I'm, I'm, you yeah, know, I was, I'm part of. I was about to say that it must be a better crowd as well because it's the better would be unfair. On, better would be unfair. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was I mean, a better crowd, but it fits like your preference. It's my demographic, right? Yeah, 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 yeah but I, mean, I would have gone partying with. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and people, but people that are into that vibe as well, and were. That, so they'll connect with all this. You can still play the soul music without yeah. clearing the dance floor. Not only that as well, I feel like that demographic, because they're not out every week, because they're, I mean, I'm generalizing, but probably like a lot of them have careers and jobs and stuff. Families, like this. yeah. But they've, they've then, they're out to spend money that night because they're not doing it every week and not yeah, on a budget. Night, so, oh, okay, this, this might be the only time we're out like this this year. So you know, let's go in. So, you know, you know what, what? That's just reminded me. Mm-hmm. We do a yearly event at the Ritz 
at the in Manchester, right, in December. I started it a few years back. I just came up with a concept because we were doing New Year's Eve in London with Trevor, but I wanted to do something around that time. But obviously you couldn't do two nights on the mm. two events on the same night. And Manchester, I love Manchester. I love Birmingham and Manchester, right? So um, a friend of mine was working for the company that owns all the O2s. We'd done some events. And I saw that Ritz venue and I thought, oh, I love this venue. We'd done a couple of shows there as well. So then, me, so I, I convinced Trevor to do, like in between Christmas and New Year's, we started doing a party. That party is phenomenal. That venue is amazing. Um, I don't know if you've played there double, but I know Stylus has probably played there for shows. You've done shows, concerts, yeah, yeah. whatever. Done right? a few bits. Bro, that venue, when we do that Soul Nation party with Trevor, pretty much every Christmas. So it's in, it's 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 between Christmas and New Year's, right? Around the 27th, 28th, whichever. It sells out. It's that older crowd. They come dressed up. It is there probably once a year that they come out hard. Yes, me. <laughs> it is the best feeling. I get emails every year or messages to Trevor's Facebook page saying, when are you releasing that? This year, mm. when are you releasing it? I've already had people saying, when are you releasing that day? So when you get gigs like that, you, you've got gigs like that, right? You know that gig is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and the that Golden gig Bookings, we do in man. Manchester, bro, it's unbelievable. When the Ritz is full and like the, the all around the top is full. The and top the floor, is nuts. Like the layout, like it's a proper old school classic venue. Like it's untouched. It's pretty, it's a little bit ruggedy, but like yeah. it, wor it works though. Like yeah, It works, man. And like the first year, <laughs> I think we had, so I always try to book a guest. I think we had damaged the first year and they tore the roof off. The last one we did, we had Bobby Valentino. He happened to be in, in London. So we took him up and it's just like, it doesn't even matter about the PAs. I'm not, I'm just saying like we, we I try to put more into it because I feel like it's such a great gig. I want to give people the best night ever. And they usually do. And when you've got a night like that, you'll never get tired of it. You don't need to be re no. reinvigorated for that one. Um, so yeah, it just depends. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the student stuff. I I'll tell you what I love though. It's not the actual night. I love my bug is coming up with a concept, coming up with this idea you know, whether it be the artwork, the lineup, what you know what I mean, how how are you gonna do that uh, and deliver it, how you know, clever ways to market it. That's why I, I really, really still love and enjoy it. Um that's the hard bit though, isn't it? Yep. No, yeah, yeah, it, is. it sounds like every every DJ <laughs> needs a Hanif in their life by the sounds of things, because that's that's all the that's all team, the stuff man. I'm no good at. <laughs> yeah, no, but you need a good team, and I just feel like, yeah, you said it before, you just need to do what you're good at. I think it's like I said, do what you're good at. And then maybe bring in someone yeah, who is the rest better of at the other bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if you complement each other, it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I love working with people like that. You know what I mean? Who who do things better than me? Um, bring them in. I think some people struggle with the with the delegation aspect, aspect isn't it? Like you say, someone is trying try to take it on and do all of it themselves. When in reality, is like sometimes you just have to sit there and be like, "Look, I ain't too great at this." Like that means. Yeah. Outsource yeah. over there. Outsource over there. Have some young kids, Stylus, and that will force you to delegate. Yeah, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. Oh, um, just you wait, my friend. <laughs> yeah, why are you trying to put me under pressure with, with this whole kids? I know, I know. I, I I'm, I'm shook with when it comes to kids, man. I I'm just, about that. It's all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm just not there, guys. <laughs> leave, that to, leave that to me. Mate, you. take your time. Take your time. But, yeah, no, I, I think, and, and that's another thing. You know what I mean? You, your life changes. Like, doubles, obviously, life has changed. You know, you've got family now. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that you, you're going to take your foot off the pedal, but you've got to have different priorities. In a way, it kind of forces you to, though, know, really. I mean, it's it's something, and I'm very open about the fact that ever since, so my son's eight, he's nearly nine, and ever yeah, since... the same was, age, yeah. Ever since... Eldest is the same age. Right, so ever since um, my son was born, I've struggled with getting the work-father balance because it's like, okay, I want to be a great dad and I want to have all these memories. I know I want to be there as he's growing up when he's taking his first step, saying his first words, doing all this stuff. But I also have a job that's not, it doesn't look after itself. I don't just earn nine to five money. I have to be on the pole, like all the time, my foot's got to be down. Do you know what I mean? Working. And that means being away for weekends, it means flying abroad for a couple of days to go and do these jobs and missing certain key points of family life because I have to make a living. So I, that's where it is like, 
I remember reading a book once that uh, what was the book called? It was it was called Making It in Business Without Losing It in Life. And it was about that. It was about how to get that balance. Right? It was a really good book and it changed my perspective. And from reading that book, I did sort of step back a little bit with DJing and take my foot off and focus on what was important with the DJing rather than filling my time with stuff that wasn't important but yeah. added to DJ. Does that make any sense? Is it hard Absolutely. trying to find that balance? Like us two people who yeah. have got, got like kids that are like eight, nine now, like you've kind of been been through the most of it, like trying to find that balance at first, obviously going hundred mile an hour, all of a sudden you've got someone else that you need to put before everything. Like yeah, how yeah. did it, how does it, how did it change for you lot? And did, did you struggle with it at first? Well, I mean, you can go first and if. Um, <laughs> yeah, I resented some of it at first. But I'm so glad that I was forced to do a lot of it um, in hindsight. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, I always say as well, I had, you know, yeah, my oldest is eight. I've got a two year old and a three month old as well. I was going to say, you've got a, a brand new one as well, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, baby. So it's <laughs> like, yeah, so um, yeah, the, f the first one was, was, was like when he came along, it was fun and I was still able to work and I wanted to work and I could juggle things. When the second one came along, it became really tough, I think. Like, um, and that actually, thinking about it, is probably the primary reason I stopped working so many nights you. because you have to be up early and they don't care that you just walked in at four o'clock. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> and, and, and that's a common theme. A lot of people have said that, right? A lot of DJs say that. Your yeah. kids don't care that you've walked in at four o'clock in the morning. They want you up on a Saturday or yeah. running a student night. Just because I've got in at four o'clock on, on Tuesday doesn't mean that they're not awake at 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it definitely changed me. But I'm so glad that I did it later on in life because I think when I was running around DJing, I would have been horrible dad. Yeah. Horrible dad. Like, <laughs> I, think, I think that's what worries me, man. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty... Active, like, still, yeah, you're yeah active. man so i'm just like i'm worried that i'm gonna be a shit dad man because i don't slow down like but then I again do i need to be forced do i need to be for that's it do i need you'll it forced, forced on me and you do and that's why maybe all of us do kind of tend to leave it a little bit later because <laughs> you've got ambitions and you, I'm, I'm not even saying you're consciously doing it this is a subconscious thing um because the day it happens it changes you. It does. Like yeah, yeah. we both know that. We we both. Know. Everyone I know, it just changes them. Well, and it should do. Hopefully, it should do. Um, but yeah, you you find your way, man. But um, it is tough because the kid don't care. That's it. Kid don't care that you're a famous <laughs> DJ. You don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what you said. Like up until, I think probably up until he was about four. Roman would run into my room in the morning. Morning, daddy. And then boom, I was getting belly flopped straight on my face. Like, morning, daddy. Like opening my curtains. Look, it's day, like, no, it's not daytime, man. I've been, I've, been like, about, I've been in bed for about half an hour. <laughs> <the> side, mate. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? Um, so yeah, it is, it is a struggle, but it's, it's something you adapt to. I remember the worst time for me was um, when he was a newborn. And up until about four or five months old, I would come in from the club and bear in mind, so uh, I moved to, as I said to you before, Hanif, I moved to St. Albans from Brighton yeah. when he was born. And that is a probably 90 minute drive. So I wasn't getting in until about five, maybe six. I used to watch your YouTube videos, right? There you go. In right. the car, leaving yeah. Brighton. Yeah, it was. You used to do a gig in Brighton during the week. Yeah. And then you'd be driving up. Yeah, I, I remember watching your videos. Yeah, that's right. And that, even those videos, that wasn't, I wasn't, that was only about four or five years ago. So I wasn't documenting okay. when he was a newborn. Um, so I would get in at about five, maybe six in the morning and Leanne would be there. She's been up all night with a crying baby and she would go, there you go. <laughs> there you go. This Good is boy. yours. I'm going to bed. So I'm getting in at six in the morning and now I've got a crying baby because Leanne's been up all night with a crying baby. So yeah, yeah. It's, it, that was the trickiest. I think that was the hardest part for me. And it was just, it's got much better over time and you just get different challenges, don't you? But on the flip side, Stylus, not to scare you off, being That's your good. own boss as you guys are, you can, like, it's better than in some ways as they get older as well. 
when you're you're not someone who does a nine to five, you can devote more time to your kids in other ways. Oh, like, yeah, you can yeah, do yeah. a lot of stuff. So no man, it's um I just I just think like being a DJ, I I, I sometimes think I don't I, I definitely don't regret not having to graft as much as you not do. Because I do think like in this day and age, as much as like some DJs in the park, it's it's like football, yeah. Some some old footballers, Ian Wright sitting there going, bloody hell, how much does that crappy striker at Crystal Palace get? He gets way more than he did, right? <laughs> but it's a different time. I just, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe my analogy's got a bit with, with, but I do not want to be a DJ in this day and age. I think you lot do a lot, man. Yeah, the battleground yeah. has changed massively. Lot. Yeah, and it's you're not it's not even just DJ now. You've got to be a man of multiple talents, man. You've That's what I'm saying. You got to be able to. Oh, well, I all. could just turn up if you built your name up, right? Just turn up and DJ. No one's asking <laughs> to <laughs> post anything. No one's asking me to video stuff for my own branding. No, I'm not doing any of that. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing a podcast because I, I, I'm just literally buying records, working out how I'm gonna. Bro, if I'm really honest, yeah, and I can be honest now. I didn't even, for most of my time, I didn't even have deck set up. So I never used to practice. I literally <laughs> used to work out what record I'm going to play when I get to the club. And, oh, yeah, you 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 know that, obviously, what's going to go with what. I didn't yeah. practice. <laughs> In this day and age, <laughs> mate. Fuck, you know. Yeah, it's different The, the wild thing about it now is, in in the times we're in now, you almost have to build your fan base online. You have yeah. to build a virtual fan base to make it equate to a club booking. Bro, it's how wild. do you like, know? How do you know in my day how many people have actually turned up to see Hanif DJ? You don't. No. It's true. It's true. I don't have to justify it. A lot of the time now, oh, how many followers has he got? Yeah. Oh, if he posts, how many likes do they get on a post? Some days it's tiring, man. Like, oh, I, 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 I would play, not want to be that guy. Bro, listen, <laughs> I I'll, play, I'll play the game most times, man. But then you have days where you're just like, bro. No, I'm I know just, that. Do you know what? I'm just, I'm just on it right now. Like, St- Stylus, you know, I say all of that because I'm always an advocate for the DJ, right? Because I've, I've, cause I've been a DJ, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm coming up against, I, I sometimes argue with people that I'm working with. Listen, promote a job to promote, DJ to DJ. Don't need to. But then I'm now seeing certain promoters big promoters contracts in the contract it says you've got to post x amount of time you've yeah. got to do this you've got to do that now i'll be doing myself a disservice if i don't start moving like that because i'll be the only one who's not doing it mm-hmm. but i'm against it though i am against it i mean if i ask if i book double and i say dubs can you just put it on your instagram cool he, he'd probably do it mm-hmm. but what i find difficult is like badgering the di- yo do it again you haven't done one this week. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. like that. But I know that's how the industry is moving. And I know that there's contracts out there with big artists which stipulate what they must do. Yeah, yeah, the game. I struggle with that. Front. Even yeah, though I'm probably going to be the one asking you to do that. I do, do you think? Do you think that that kind of um, expectation should come with a raise in fees as well? In a sense that if I've got, so I've got my fan base just using me as an example, I've got my fan base on Instagram that you want to tap into. So you've booked me. So you already know yeah. you're going to get a good DJ, but now you also want to tap into my online fan base. Yeah. Sh- should there be, okay, well, yeah, you want access to them. I need to charge you some more because that's my fan base that I built up. So you want to get into my database with your advertising. Well, mm. from a, pro- from a promoter point of view, what do you think about that? It's a catch 22. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm booking you so that I can tap into your market. And, and exactly. Now you can't turn around and say, well, if you want to tap into my market, it's a right. different thing. Mm-hmm. I feel that's a catch-22. In this day and age, it, all, it's, it feels like it's part and parcel of the whole package. I'm not booking you just because you're going to DJ. I'm booking you for everything else. That's the problem. I'm, I'm, I'm actually saying I'm uncomfortable with it, but that mm-hmm. is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that is what it is. Um, you know, yeah, when, when other people are telling me, look, here's a contract that festival promoters give to big, big house DJs, and it stipulates you've got to make a video, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to post it like this, da 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 So, okay, as much as I want to be for the DJs, 
I also don't want to be mugged off as a promoter. Yeah, if everyone yeah. else, if you're doing it for everyone else, well, okay, we can, we, we should look at that. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard, man. I mean, it's almost just a thing now though. I mean, I, I post, if, if I'm doing guest sets somewhere, if the promoter's doing a promo video, I'm like, yeah, send it, WhatsApp me. I'll chuck yeah. it straight on my Instagram. I'll share that. Of course, I I want my people to come and see me if I'm in yeah. that area. Do you know what I mean? So it's like... But then, but obviously the, the thing that I'm kind of un, uh, unhappy about doing is like, you know, forcing a DJ. Because, yeah, you know yeah. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't feel that's... It's going back to my thing. I book a DJ <clears> because I feel like he does a good job. Hmm. But now your job is more than just playing music it seems um it's about all the and there are certain djs who are just getting booked because they've managed to package themselves really well 100 i don't have it I'm not, I'm not dissing that dj for doing that that's fine they played the game yeah I think it, was a, do... it was a different process as well man like we used to book like back then it was separate jobs promoters would promote DJs will DJ, like you say, they've kind of just merged together over the over the years to the point where now it, like you say, it's catch twenty two. You book a headline. Right, let me ask you a question, right? Him. Let me Go throw on. this back at you in a different way. Go on then. So one of my pet hates, right, is because I'm quite an introverted person. The whole bigging up what you do, right? DJs like. Oh, this is my diary for the next month. It's 72 gigs. <laughs> 15 I find that a bit crass. 15 of them are in the same venue. <laughs> right, right. I find that a bit crass, right? But hold on. I'm the same guy who's asking you to post my stuff. So why do I find that crass? What do you, how do you guys feel about that? And obviously, from a marketing point of view, there will be a promoter who sees you post that, thinks, oh, he's a popular DJ. So I'm going to book him. So I'm a bit of a prick for thinking like that, really. Um, well, Martin will tell you, I, I, I always, like, I used to give him grief. But then I had to understand that if he doesn't self-promote, like, there's a value to him doing that for yeah. his brand, right? But just because I have, I'm a little bit kind of backwards in being forward, am I being really unfair? I probably am. So I've done that in the past. I've posted up flyers with like, let's just say June's dates. And then I've got, yeah. I don't know, like 21 dates in June, certain residencies, some guest spots. My intention with those, I always would put at the end of that, at the bottom in a line saying July and August dates available, mm -hmm. email. Da, 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 da. So it was almost advertising exactly yeah, like market. you said. It was like me saying, look, June, I am fully booked up right now. Like, I literally can't play well, anymore if I wanted to. You don't even have to justify it. I just feel like I am that my mentality is wrong for this present um, era of DJ because I struggle with having to sell myself. Mm. Got you. And I feel like that's why I would be unsuccessful in this present era. I'm, I'm actually saying there's nothing wrong with what you guys do, but I found it uncomfortable because I'm from a generation that we didn't do that. It's right, almost yeah. like it's almost like you want to be. In fact, I know some of the older DJs; they would prefer not to shout about what they're doing. Mm. But I, I, now, if you don't shout about it, you're going to be like lost. I, I would I would prefer it that way, to be honest. And I've always said, if I if I didn't work in this industry doing what I did, I'd delete all my social media tomorrow. Like literally, I, I would have nothing. I yeah, I have, think, I'd yeah, be I so be disconnected. There, I don't. I'd, I'd probably have a mobile, but I wouldn't have any apps, no social media, nothing. That's my extreme, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, it is because I. I, I don't know. I don't. Do you, like, like, do, you, do you really not like social media? No, no, I don't like it. I don't. I don't like the. Um, the it's like a superficial competition that goes on. That's, so, my, that's one of my things, like, because I feel like a lot of the time the DJs are doing it to get one up on the next DJ and 100%. just to overshine the next DJ. And I'm like, yeah, it's not about that. No, not at all. Not. And then you see other DJs copying what you're doing because they want to compete with you. And I'm like, no, nah, that's, I find that uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's a weird space. And I think because it's such a new space with our industry, it hasn't quite settled yet. I, I mean, new, obviously, I know it's kind of 10 years in, but it hasn't really settled yet as to how we all use it. 
that's why it's all a bit weird. That's why someone will see Stylus post one of his like quick flips videos and they see it get 10,000 views and they think, oh, Stylus is busy in the clubs. He's done that. I'm going to do that. And, and it just, it just all I gets a bit weird. I think that's a common thing in the game now. When someone has a formula that works, it just automatically rolls off onto other people and they either copy it or tweak a little thing here and there and kind of go. That's be honest, going on since be honest, life. be honest. If someone copies something that you've come up with, does it get to you? Yeah. Yeah, it does a I lot. Think of it, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, 100% it does. Like, it, for pe- if people say that it, it doesn't get to them, i I got to say that they're, they're chatting a bit of poo-poo. Of like, yeah. course, if someone copies or bites your idea, it will get to you. But then again, no idea is really original anymore. It's I also agree done, with that. It's either been done in a different that. form or a different way. Like, nothing is really super original now. Like, everything's mm-hmm. being done at some point. Do you know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. it's... I get what you were saying, though. Like, I have moments where I'm like, I'm sick of promoting myself. Like, am I forcing this on people too much? I'm being too loud. It's too much over there. I spend all my time talking about football on Twitter these days. <laughs> and then kind of just keep my DJ and stuff over on, like, Instagram and my mixes and, and whatnot on YouTube and Twitch. And Twitter's kind of just my playground to say whatever the hell I, I want. But, I, yeah, I agree, man. Especially if you're, like, you say, more of an introverted character. Yeah. Being loud on socials is the last thing you want to be doing. So it's... Yeah, man. There's no right or wrong answer, is it? No. There's no right or wrong. That's the no. thing, I think. No, because some some people thrive on Instagram. Yeah. And some some DJs are doing really well. Um, even there's a producer, uh, I can't remember what his name is, but he wears like a glittery mask. Oh, and does, yeah, the, yeah. does the mashups and stuff. Yeah. That, um, Twitter, Instagram is his playground and TikTok, I'm sure, as well. Like yeah. incredible and his engagement and numbers are through the roof. And I'm sure whether he's a producer or a DJ or whatnot, he'll, his bookings will fly out as soon as he, as soon as everything's open up. But like, yeah, for me, it's... Yeah, and then when he gets to the amazing. club and realises he has to do that routine live. <laughs> 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 and it all goes absolutely western. Yeah, right, I, I've got to stop being like my old man mentality. I think that's what it is. You just got to move with the times. Whatever, the, the, this did you, this is called. it, man. Like moving with, like you've seen a lot of generations now. Like, are you... Yeah. Are you happy with the way everything is now, the new tech? Because it made your life a bit easier in regards to, like you say, running the events and whatnot. You kind of, you kind of don't really yeah, need yeah. to. It's, it's, it, yeah, it, it's, um, yeah. All right, if we just talk about how to run events, yeah. You know, social media has made, like I said, I can sell out a bucket load of events before a student even gets from his, to From his living room on his laptop. Yeah, you can. You don't even <laughs> you don't have to do it. Mate, I, me, I had an old, old partner. We did... Um, we used to do like events, like he was from Cardiff and he studied in Manchester. And I remember like, you know, going on road trips. Like, so we did, we did Calice once, right? Do you remember Majestic in Leeds? Majestic, right? wow. Legendary club, right? Wow. Mate, we used to like get in a car, poster boards, glue, poster, out until six, seven in the morning, being chased by cameras and council people. Da, 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 da. You think I missed that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, even, even to the point where, you know, ticketing, I can, if you have a good relationship with Skiddle, like you guys do, or Eventbrite, they do so much marketing on your behalf. Yeah, it's become better. It, it, it's definitely, technology is not a bad thing um, at all. I mean, for DJs as well, you know, we were so reluctant to move from vinyl to CD, then CD to digital. It's just, and now you guys, what you guys do with the equipment is nuts. It's absolutely nuts. Do you know what I mean? With a laptop and a mixer, it's nuts. Mm. So, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, man. Why? I, I want to know what the next stage is. That's it. Like, where do we go next? I feel like now with this whole lockdown stuff, like with DJing, like this is like the next evolvement stage of the, like the, nightclubs yeah. and events. But the one thing I've, I've always said, and I think I've been proved right as well by this last year, yeah, because I've always said you cannot, humans are, it's all about social interaction, yeah. You will never make that go online. That's the mm-hmm. one thing, like, as much as people have done online parties, Zoom parties, da 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 That feeling of being in a room with everybody else and experiencing music in the same way, I believe will never go. I believe we'll, there'll always be some form of human interaction. And that, from a business point of view, as a promoter, that's really important. I don't want it to go online. I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy that. I don't like that. Um, so that's the one thing that has been reinforced 
by the last 12, 15 months is that, you know what, we want that social interaction. We want to be physically next to people who are sweating and listening to the same music. That's, that's nothing. Like, you can't beat being in the in a sweaty, un, like them underground clubs where it's a bit more intimate and everyone's kind of <laughs> on top of each other, yep. a bit, bit mosh pity. Like, they were, yeah. that's exactly what jam used to be. Like, that was... It was the roof would drip like at some yeah. point. Like, <laughs> yes. too, too round. They were they were the best nights. Man. That's what you want, man. And you don't want this. What I find is quite um, what's the word? Not stale, but very clinical. Sorry, mm-hmm. you know, being at the other end of the screen. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some some great bonuses like you know you can do Zoom calls and all this, and this is great. Mm-hmm. But to replicate going out clubbing, I think the only way I always, I think. You're right in the sense that physical presence in the club will always be a thing, but I do think the mainstream events will eventually, and I don't know how quickly or or slowly this will happen, but it will coincide with how popular VR becomes. Virtual, yeah, yeah. So when virtual reality becomes as popular as Instagram and everyone has a headset and we sit down to do a podcast and we're all in the room together virtually with our headsets on like this, but we just see each other as if it was physical. I think that's when you're going to start to see virtual reality events where you can literally stand in your bedroom, put your VR on and you're in the club and everyone else, everyone else that's joined that and you've got the surround sound in your ears and the DJs connected. I think that's the future of clubs, of mainstream clubs, but I don't know. That could be like the 50 year future. Well, of listen, I hope it's not I mean? in my lifetime because I am not yeah. on that. Well, I think as it will be. As much as I that seems logical, be. as much as that seems logical, but I'm still, I'm still holding out for the fact that we like that physical interaction, that oh, social sure. interaction in it face to face. I mean, VR, I mean, maybe it will be able to replicate that in years to come. I'm sure it will be, but, um, yeah, we shall see, man. Before we finish up, I've got one question. This might this this might sound like a proper wild question. There's a reason I've asked it, and it goes. <laughs> it you goes. Here, Come on. No, no, no. It You're just not goes. Do it at Alhan and go. Are oh, you a bokeh? No, no, I'm not, no, 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 we, no, we no. don't have any of them moments. <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes back to your time working at Ministry. Obviously, you're still there, but I'm talking about the earlier days. There's a reason I'm asking this. Did you ever wear a bulletproof vest to work? What I kind didn't. of a question you is didn't. that? I didn't. No, no, no. So the reason I've asked is, so do you know, <laughs> do you know Michelle Hunter? Yeah. You know Michelle? She ran smooth. I know there was a, there was a time for quite a while she that does. where she was, she was promoting smooth, which style yeah. she might not know. It was like the biggest black music. I mean, it started off as garage actually, didn't it? It was, yeah, it was garage, garage in one and room, then... garage in one room, R and B and hip hop in the other room. Yeah. And Again, uh, another significant, significant night. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and she she so. used to wear a bulletproof yeah. vest because she was out the front of ministry promoting, basically. Yeah, I, I didn't do that night. So did it ever cross your mind, or was it just your night didn't? No, have no, that kind it, of... it, it was to do. It was to do with the style of night. Um, right. Okay. Never crossed. I, I was. Um, I had a very the, the, yeah man. You know what? Them days, I used to obviously go. Um, I, I do you know what? There's a story. So. There's a very famous kind of in-house story. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle worked her way up. She's a G man. She yeah, worked yeah. her way up, right? Um, she was a flyer girl to start with, I think, and then she ended wow. up running the night. Love but um, yeah, she's a G. But um, there used to be stories, right? So this is in the deep in the garage days. Da, 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 da. One week, a doorman was shot. Yeah, mm-hmm. shot in the arm. I think he didn't die. The shot. The following week. It was the busiest, it was the busiest night they've ever had, right? That era, it was like, it was a hype thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And ministry, like Smooth was the best. It was so amazing. Yeah, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, for me, I said Hanover Grand, yeah, because I went religiously when I was a student. It's probably due to my age. But when, um, that, that was fresh and funky on a Wednesday. But when Smooth was Smooth, when it was in its peak, right, it was the ultimate urban night, right? Um, but it attracted a lot of the bad people. Do you know what I mean? Elephant and so, and Castle as well, isn't it? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like, <laughs> it was it was a time where all the doormen wore bulletproof vests, right? Um, Ministry's doormen were known for being the most ruthless back then. Um, and that's why Ministry was able to run that night. 
because it was just so hardcore. But one thing that did happen that, that it did affect me, and it was, no, I haven't ever, ever worn a bulletproof vest. Um, I used to do all the bank holidays. So I did urban stuff alongside my shoot stuff. Um, so I, and I used to do a lot of the, we used to do an Iron Napa reunion, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I've always done Carnival Weekend, right? The Carnival Monday, the bank holiday Monday of Carnival, always had the after party for the last 10 years, I think, right? Probably longer. Um, one year we were sold out. And the night before, it was a night called Back to Night at Five, which is a garage night mm -hmm. on the Sunday. Bank holiday Sunday, I'm on the, I'm on the Monday. And it's, we're sold out on the Monday. And I don't know why, and I think I touched on this before, I had some flyers left. So I thought, let me just come and fly out, right, this night. <laughs> I was at Back to 95 anyway, it's a wicked night. It's, it's such a great garage night. Um, but there was an altercation inside and two guys in the VIP ended up getting into something. Dorman ejected one through the back gates, one through the front gates. And then the one who was, came out the front gates, got into his car, waited around the corner for the other guy to come around. And this is a famous story. It was all over the news. He, 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 when he saw, or one of, one of his people told him that guy was outside, he, he drove around in his car. Um, the car went onto the pavement. It was a massive pavement, like you could drive across a, a ministry and hit the guy. The guy went, you know, 10 feet in the air, came down, died, oh, died wow. straight away. Wow. Oh, wow. And so the next day, my event was, was cancelled. So there were times in that garage era where it was hairy, man. The people that was out partying. And it was crazy. These guys were both drunk. And they, and from what I understand, it was just like, you know, someone just bumped someone in the VIP and that was it. Mm. And they were so intoxicated and they were, you know, road men and whatever. Um, so yeah, so ministry put on some amazing nights, but it, it came with some um, some mad moments. So yeah, and I do remember, yeah, the venue manager, Michelle, people like that having to wear, because if you're going to stand on that front door, you had to wear a vest. Crazy. <coughs> it was a recurring thing in Manchester that over the years, like whenever there was an event that got traction and became like <coughs> the spot, you would always attract... The, the idiots, man. It was. Just, Have just you just ever played at home? Bro? Did What's you ever that? play at home? Did you ever play at a nightclub called Home? No, I don't think. No, so. not Home. Um, Hacienda. I never played the Hacienda, man. Okay. Never got so to play again. There. Going back to very quick story before we go, right? <laughs> when I was DJing, you know, I was a student DJ. I was doing student parties all around the country. These guys booked Hacienda. First time I went to Manchester in my life. Yeah, it was a weekday. It was a student night. Drove up there. With my mates, and I remember the club had two massive wooden doors, mm -hmm. right? I don't know what area of Manchester it was in. I, I wasn't that familiar. Hacienda's at the end of Dean's Gate Locks. Okay, it was. it's a it's an apartment block now. So right, so we get there. I'm outside with my record bag, da -da -da -da, waiting to go in, and it was so nuts in Manchester in them days. Basically, some of, some of the local guys had turned up. They weren't going to be let in because. The doorman had said, nah, it's a student night, you can't come in. Da, 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 da. They stood across the road, picked up bricks, oh, and started man. chucking bricks. Bro, awesome. Manchester was a mad place. <laughs> now remember, yeah. we're still on the other side of the road. I've got to go in and DJ, and the, the doorman, obviously they're not faced by it because Manchester was a bad <laughs> place. They just shut these massive, like huge wooden doors, and all you could hear is like, these boys throwing bricks like the local <laughs> some game of thrones shit. Nah. Oh, it was so. <laughs> it was, but for me, I was like, hold on the inside the dormants. <laughs> I'm not a bad man. I don't know what I'm doing here. In the end, they went away, and then we got in. But yeah, that was my first experience of, of Manchester. Manchester was, yeah, it was so hood. Back Manchester then. had a really bad run, man. To the point where a lot of the doors were run by the gangsters. Like yeah, back yeah. in the day, it's oh, it's completely opposite now. Like it's very it's very chill compared to like nineties, eighties. But, but you know. Can I ask you about that? Because I still get like when we do some of the shows, like especially some of the rap shows, yeah. Um, that certain, certain venues still really act up, or the doorman really act up. It's almost like the doorman, especially some of the black doorman, mm -hmm. put the fear of life into the man venue manager who might be yeah. some, you know, middle middle class. 
I'll say white, but you know what I mean? Just someone one or two comments. That's it, man. One or two comments from the door team to, yeah, to, the, to the management. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I don't know, guys. I'm not sure about this. Not sure about this one. Like, yeah, we find that we've so it. frustrating. And so, most of the time, these guys that do the talking aren't even in contact with anybody. I don't know how mm. they. It's it's these are, like, these, they're on the front line, isn't it, honey? If that's what it is, them guys are on the front line. So, like, they're the first people that are getting a little, like, thinking, oh, this might bring the, the, the yeah. wrong crowd or whatever. So, they express the concerns, which is enough to get your flipping shit locked off, mate, if you've got one of them managers who's a bit bit ropey. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, well, well, lovely, yeah. So, going lockdown, back to man. the point, although ministry was bad, <laughs> I don't think it's ever been as bad as Manchester. <laughs> oh, my days. <laughs> I'm getting my little digging. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, Man- Manchester now is very, very chill, man. Honestly. I told like, you, man. I love Manchester. I love Birmingham, man. It's all about people need to get out around the country, man. Birmingham is... Yeah, facts. Pin. Bro, last time I had a bucking in Birmingham, I'm coming out of there thinking pelters, mate. Like, I don't know where you're going, man. We all, we all need to pass through Silks, Silks parties, man. They look amazing. Yeah, road yeah, trip. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, 100% doing, up for that. Let's do a road trip. Definitely. Let's do that, man. Well, Hani, thank you very much for your time, man. I can't believe we managed to... Get, we, what have we grabbed? Like two and a half hours of well, yeah. famous no, Hani's time. This is amazing. I, no, I, no, I appreciate it. it, especially as I'm embarrassed to say when Martin and Andy asked me to do something for them very similar, I said I wouldn't do it. And so then when he heard that I was doing <laughs> yours... He... Love that. <laughs> oh dear, I might have dropped I you that. in then. I, no, yeah. no, it's all love, man. It's, no, do you know what? It's really time, good. And, and I do... I do watch your your um, pods that from time to time. I've seen a few because I know like um, Double was like, oh yeah, this is how we do the show. Da, da, da. I was like, bro, I've, I've watched it, man. It's, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's I already, interesting. I already know this. Like, yes. Yeah, sometimes it gets really geeky and I love that, man. I, lo- I love that. Yeah, but sometimes but you have super geeky techie ones and other times it can just be very banterous. Like, uh, but, it's, uh, but this is, do you know what? I, I, I keep extending it, but I do love like the camaraderie between so many of you DJs these days. It's, it's really, really, really like refreshing because there was a time when DJs hated each other. I'm not, I'm sure they still do, but it just feels like it's a, there's a lot more kind of, um, there's a brotherhood there, man. So it's always good to see. Yeah, I hear that. That's, that's, that's a great shout. That's a great that way to finish as well. Amazing. Lovely. Thank yeah. you guys, man. I really appreciate that. Howdy. Thank, thank you, brother. Yeah, boy. <laughs> My guy. I'll see you in a club somewhere soon. <laughs> <laughs>